All right, it's time for another video. You may hear something in the background. That's my breathing exercise. Health and wellness is, is something important to working with computers, especially to working with computers, because, you know, we're behind a computer screen all day sitting. It, it can be very taxing uh, on health. So one of the things I like to do in addition to my treadmill desk is these breathing exercises here. So it's it's resonant, coherent breathing, and what it does is it tunes your your like it 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 keeps your breathing optimal. It's like you can maintain conscious control over your breathing because a lot of times when we get anxiety disorders and stuff like that what's really happening is you're breathing in really erratic ways and it's because these these thoughts and, and these situations are altering your breathing without you knowing that's happening and without you being able to alter your breathing back to a more optimal way so you es essentially run out of you know control of your breath and you're kind of in this crisis situation where you're just not getting the kind of, you know, like the breathing is, and I'm not, a, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a doctor at all, but uh, l let me just keep this short and move on because, you know, the goal of this channel isn't to get medical advice. Please don't take medical advice from me. But this is one of the things I do just kind of to, if anyone's interested, because, you know, it's, it's the whole package. It's not just about, oh, this is cloud networking. This is this, this is that. It's, you know, how do you concentrate on something? How do you, like, how do you actually do things that matter and, and do those things consistently time and time again? My answer is mental health. Make sure you're in really good mental health and that's a uh, good way to do that. Mental and physical health, I think, are, are important. So this is one of the things I do that I found effective, especially for mental health, is these this resonant, coherent breathing exercise, which is to decouple your breathing from anything around you. So you should be able to go do anything and not have it alter the flow of your breathing. Unless, of course, you're running and you have to take more breaths. But conscious control over breathing, breathing exercises, I've found to be useful, but, you know, not medical advice. All right, so I'm going to leave that running. I'll take the... Well, actually, no, I'm going to turn it off because there's a lot of it left. So now um, this is, yeah, so going back to where I left off, I just made a video earlier. It was on the infrastructure module for engineer kit. I was having problems with my computer. So let's see if those problems are fixed. All right, and the problems don't appear to be fixed. I did reboot my computer. Ah, okay, so the problem, okay, the problem is fixed. Okay, good, that that changes things. <laughs> oh, and uh, I can have sedentary time if I want it. Um, I do want it, I do want it. Okay, so I'm gonna take it. Oh, oh, oh God, that hurt, ow. I stubbed my toe like hard, like probably a few times a month. I've probably broken my toes before whatever they just heal up all right so let's do uh, a part five on the engineer kit module all right. so there we go so okay so we're, we're, we're going through each of the resources uh, this one I, I've watched multiple times I've done a Anki deck on it I think I'm going to mark this one as done and go on to some of the other resources. So uh, let me do that right now. So I've got, oh, but I, I don't know if I have all the problems solved. Okay. Yeah. Okay. This is working now. Perfect.
Mm. Oh my god. Carnival squash. Mm. Man. It's so sweet. Ah, my internet is not good. Uh, I guess it's not up. It's just it's just the site. This thing right here. This thing right here. My my lord. My lord. Yeah, uh, sweet nutty flavor. And by sweet, they mean like almost like a date. All right, my upload speed is really bad, but uh, let's keep going. So, okay, I think I have all of that pushed up. Yeah, I have all of that pushed up. I don't have any changes. I have an extension here. It needs like an, oh, it needs a reload. Okay, I'll do that. All right, and then, yeah, so I'm gonna mark mark this as done here. I'll do a get status, get add, and then get commit. Say video watched multiple times. Video watched multiple times. Uh, what else? Uh, yeah, Anki deck made. Deck made and used, but nothing stuck. Yeah, so nothing kind of stuck with this. So, uh, okay, so there we go. Um, now, now this is done. If I go here and I refresh it, uh, yeah, that's done. So now let's see, we've got resources, tools, 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 videos. Uh, here's a video series. So I guess Kubernetes. I, I guess I want to let's let's start on this uh, video series now. So this is Google Cloud Tech, and it's a uh, video series. So uh, yeah, let's do this now. I hear everyone has been talking about it, and you've probably heard of it too. It's become pretty popular, and I think it's time to learn what it is. With a whole universe of things to learn, it's important to start with the essentials. Let's go over the concepts that make Kubernetes usable, scalable, and just downright awesome. Are you ready? Hey, Kaslin, good to see you. I am I ready. was just going over what Kubernetes is. That sounds like fun. Kubernetes is a portable, extensible, open source platform for managing containerized workloads and services that facilitates both declarative configuration and automation, letting you run distributed systems resiliently with scaling and failover for your application. Okay, well, uh, that's a lot. Do you have a way to simplify that? Good call. Basically, it's a container orchestrator that helps make sure that each container is where it's supposed to be and that the containers can work together. Oh, yeah, that, that makes me think of a conductor that manages everything in an orchestra. You know, are the horns going? Oh, the drums, they should be going now. Exactly. There's a lot of moving points in a scalable application. Just like a conductor makes sure the song sounds like a composer wants, Kubernetes makes sure services are running smoothly the way an app developer wants. Mm. Okay, before we get into more details about the what, let's go over why it was created. See, there are a lot of applications that we call monoliths, which means they put all the functionality, like transactions, third-party integration, into a single deployable artifact. And monoliths are a common way to build applications, even today. But they still have their downfalls. For example, deployments can take a long time, since everything has to roll out all together. And if different parts of the monolith are managed by different teams, there could be a lot of additional complexity when prepping for a rollout. And scaling has the same problem. Teams have to throw resources at the whole application, even if the bottleneck is only on a single area. Right. So people came up with microservices. Each piece of functionality is split apart into smaller individual artifacts. If there's an update, only that exact service has to be replaced. 
And the microservice model has scaling benefits too. Now individual services can be scaled to match their traffic, so it's easier to avoid bottlenecks without over-provisioning. This is all great, but having one machine for each service would require a lot of resources and a whole bunch of machines. That's why containers are the perfect choice. With containers, teams can package up their services neatly. All the applications, their dependencies, and any necessary configuration get delivered together. This also means that they can be sure their services will run the same way, no matter where they're run. But there's still more problems that remain unsolved. Upgrading a container is easy since you can create a new version of the container and deploy it in place of the old one. But how can upgrades be done without downtime? How do these containers know how to talk to the other ones? And how can the app developer debug issues and observe what's happening? And now we've come back to the conductor of our container orchestra. Kubernetes is all about managing these containers on virtual machines, or nodes. The nodes and the containers they run are grouped together as a cluster, and each container has endpoints, DNS, storage, and scalability. Everything that modern applications need, without the manual effort of doing it yourself. Kubernetes automates most of the repetition and inefficiencies of doing everything by hand. The app developer tells Kubernetes what it wants the cluster to look like, and Kubernetes makes it happen. See, this all sounds amazing. So, everyone should just switch to Kubernetes, yeah? Well, not so fast. Microservices still have their own unique challenges. And sometimes a monolith can be the right solution, based on what's right for the application itself. And monoliths can still run on Kubernetes, even though they won't be able to use all the same benefits. Hmm. Either way, how do you know when you're ready to get started with Kubernetes? Well, the first step is to start using containers. That's easier said than done, but let's save that for the next episode. Okay. So now we have an idea of what kinds of problems Kubernetes helps with, and we've also got an orbital view of what it actually does. Yep. Next time, let's dig into containers. Containers, huh? Okay. Stay tuned, everybody. If you want to get hands-on, check out the link in the description. And if you enjoyed the episode, subscribe for more. All right, so Kubernetes is a blah, 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 da, 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 da. My friend or Kelsey. simply put, it's a Kubernetes. It's, it's, like a, it's like a conductor of an orchestra. So it's a, it's a container orchestrator. This is frustrating. Okay, so let's talk about container orchestrators. Oh, this is even more frustrating. It doesn't speak out loud anymore. Why isn't this working? Oh, it's so frustrating. I'm frustrated. Uh... Maybe because it's too fast. So the air fares themselves waiting there. I mean, eleven months, ten minutes. We run and go to the other end. Two months old air fares waiting for players. They will just keep moving the air fares. Quiz, quiz, come read the eight. They'll put their fares on the blue. It will be eleven days. Quiz, we're all of the blue for waiting there. I mean, it's perfectly aligned for life. We're having the day while us. Certainly, container orchestrators are essential tools for managing and scaling containerized applications. They help automate the deployment, scaling, and management of containers, making it easier to run and maintain complex applications in a... Certainly, container orchestrators are essential tools for managing and scaling containerized yeah, applications. It was they help automate fast. the deployment, scaling, and management of containers, making it easier to run and maintain complex applications in a containerized environment. Two of the most popular container orchestrators are Kubernetes and Docker Swarm, although there are others like Apache Mesos and Amazon ECS. Here's a brief overview of these container orchestrators. Kubernetes, Kubernetes, often abbreviated as KAIDS, is an open source container orchestration platform developed by Google. It has gained widespread adoption in the container ecosystem. Kubernetes provides a powerful and flexible... Why is it abbreviated as K eight? The abbreviation K eight for Kubernetes is derived from a technique called numeronym, where numbers are used to represent the omitted letters in word. Okay. In this case, the eight in K eight represents the eight letters between K and S in Kubernetes. This shorthand is often used in informal written communication, like emails, chats, and documentation, to save time and space when referring to Kubernetes. Numeronyms like K eight are a fun way to create abbreviations for long words or phrases, and they can help make text more concise and easier to type. However, it's important to note that while Cades is a common abbreviation for Kubernetes in informal contexts, the full name Kubernetes is still widely used in formal documentation and discussions. Okay. Tell me the strengths and use cases of Kubernetes and Docker Swarm. Certainly, Kubernetes and Docker Swarm have their own strengths and use cases, which make them suitable for different scenarios. Here's a breakdown of their strengths and typical use cases. Kubernetes, scalability and complexity. Kubernetes excels in managing large, complex applications with a high level of scalability. It can handle clusters with thousands of nodes and tens of thousands of containers. It's a robust choice for enterprise-level applications and microservices architectures. Rich ecosystem. Kubernetes has a vast and active ecosystem with a wide range of community-contributed plugins, extensions, and tools. 
This ecosystem can help you extend Kubernetes capabilities and integrate with various services and platforms. Declarative configuration. Kubernetes uses a declarative approach, where you define the desired state of your application in YAML or JSON configuration files. Kubernetes then takes care of bringing the actual state in line with the desired state. Community and adoption. Kubernetes enjoys widespread adoption and has a large and active community, which means you can find extensive documentation, tutorials, and support. Flexibility. Kubernetes is highly configurable and can accommodate various deployment strategies, including rolling updates, blue-green deployments, canary releases, etc. Typical use cases for Kubernetes. Large-scale, complex applications, microservices, architectures, hybrid, and multi-cloud environments, environments where high availability, scalability, and resilience are critical enterprises and organizations with mature DevOps and containerization practice Docker Swarm. Simplicity and ease of use. Docker Swarm is known for its simplicity and ease of setup. It's an excellent choice for small to medium-sized teams or projects that want to get started with container orchestration quickly. Tight integration with Docker. If you are already using Docker for containerization, Docker Swarm offers seamless integration. It's part of the Docker ecosystem, making it a natural choice for Docker users. Built-in load balancing. Docker Swarm includes built-in load balancing, making it easy to distribute traffic to containers without the need for external load balancers. Scaling down. Docker Swarm handles scaling down, removing containers more gracefully than Kubernetes, which can be important for applications with variable workloads. Simplicity and cluster setup. Setting up a Docker Swarm cluster is straightforward, and it doesn't require the same level of complexity and configuration as Kubernetes. Typical use cases for Docker Swarm. Small to medium-sized applications or projects, teams, or organizations. Okay, whatever. Okay, it, it's a container orchestrator. What problems does it solve? Oh, let me let me ask the AI about this. What problems do container orchestrators solve? Container orchestrators like Kubernetes, Docker Swarm, and others solve several critical problems in the context of managing containerized applications, container deployment and scaling. Orchestrators automate the deployment of containers across a cluster of machines. It's too fast. They ensure that the right number of container instances are running to handle the application's workload. This simplifies the scaling process as containers can be added or removed dynamically based on demand. Load balance. Container orchestrators like Kubernetes, Docker Swarm, and others solve several critical problems in the context of managing containerized applications, container deployment and scaling. Orchestrators automate the deployment of containers across a cluster of machines. They ensure that the right number of container instances are running to handle the application's workload. This simplifies the scaling process as containers can be added or removed dynamically based on demand. Load balancing. Orchestrators provide built-in load balancing capabilities, distributing incoming traffic or requests evenly among container instances. This ensures that the application remains highly available and responsive. High availability, container orchestrators help maintain high availability by automatically rescheduling containers in case of failures or node outages. They can detect when a container or node becomes unhealthy and replace or reschedule it to healthy nodes. Self-healing, orchestrators constantly monitor the health of containers and can automatically restart or recreate containers that fail due to crashes or other issues. This ensures that applications remain resilient. Resource slow. allocation, they manage resource allocation, ensuring that containers have access to the necessary CP. It has to be at the speed of my, like, internal dialogue. Container orchestrators like Kubernetes, Docker Swarm, and others solve several better. critical problems in the context of managing containerized applications, container deployment and scaling. Orchestrators automate the deployment of containers across a cluster of machines. They ensure that the right number of container instances are running to handle the application's workload. This simplifies the scaling process as containers can be added or removed. All right, so a lot. The answer is, okay, so you're telling me a lot. The container orchestrators solve a lot of problems. Yes, container orchestrators indeed solve a wide range of problems and challenges associated with deploying and managing containerized applications. Okay, give me one problem that a container orchestrator solves, and don't use the word container or orchestrator in the description of this problem. Give me a real-world example. It, it can't do it, it's broken. Oh, okay, there we go. Sure, one problem that a container orchestrator solves is ensuring that a web application remains available and responsive, even if one or more servers hosting the application experience hardware failures or need maintenance. Okay, perfect. Real-world example, imagine you have a popular e-commerce website that runs on multiple servers to handle user traffic. Without a container orchestrator, if one of those servers experiences a hardware failure, e. g. a hard drive crash or motherboard issue, the website could go offline, resulting in lost sales and a poor user experience. A container orchestrator can automatically detect the server failure and redistribute the website's workload to healthy servers, ensuring that the website remains accessible okay, to users perfect. without interruption. This helps maintain high availability and minimizes downtime, even in the face of hardware issues. Okay, now I want to get kind of abstract here. So the human body has two kidneys, right? And it has other things as well that come in pairs where if one fails, the other one can take over. Kind of like how you're talking about with this real world example of a problem that container orchestrators solve so like what would the equivalent in the human body be of a container orchestrator that allows this similar feature to happen 
In the human body, the equivalent of a container orchestrator that enables redundancy and backup functionality for critical organs is the concept of organ redundancy, or organ reserve capacity. This principle is a fundamental aspect of human physiology that allows the body to maintain essential functions even if one of a pair of organs or systems experiences failure or impairment. What? Here are a few examples of such organ redundancy. Kidneys. As you mentioned, humans have two kidneys. If one kidney becomes damaged or fails, the other kidney can often compensate by increasing its filtration and excretion function. Yeah, but how is that an example of a container or orchestrator? That just seems like an example of redundant hardware. You're correct. My previous response described redundancy in the human body, which is analogous to hardware redundancy rather than a container orchestrator right. specifically. I apologize for any confusion. Let me clarify. A or, container or orchestrator doesn't have a direct tools? analog in the human body. But aren't there software tools in the human body of some kind? How does the human body know not to keep trying to use the broken kidney the human body doesn't rely on software tools in the same way that computer systems do instead it uses biological mechanisms and physiological processes to ensure the proper functioning of organs even in the presence of damage or impairment the body's ability to adapt and compensate for organ failure is a result of its complex and highly evolved biology Here's how it works. Redundancy and reserve capacity. Some organs or systems in the body have a level of redundancy, as mentioned earlier. For example, the presence of two kidneys allows the body to yeah. continue vital functions even if one kidney is compromised. Does it, though? Autoregulation. Many bodily functions are autoregulated, meaning they can adjust and adapt to changes in conditions. For instance, okay. the remaining healthy kidney can detect changes in blood pressure, blood volume, and other factors and adjust its filtration oh. and excretion rates accordingly to maintain balance. That's fascinating. Feedback mechanisms. The body employs intricate feedback mechanisms involving hormones, nervous system signals, and other biochemical processes. These mechanisms help coordinate the response to injuries or issues in real time. For example, if one kidney is damaged, the body may release hormones to help the remaining kidney compensate. That's fascinating. Compensatory growth. In some cases, organs can undergo compensatory growth or hypertrophy. Wow. If one lung is partially compromised, the other lung may increase in size and capacity to compensate for the wow. reduced function. Wow, that's amazing. Pain signals. Pain signals generated by the body often serve as a protective mechanism. When an organ is damaged, pain signals can alert the brain, causing individuals to reduce physical stress on the affected area, which can aid in recovery. It's important to note that these biological processes are not controlled by software or a centralized orchestrator in the way computer systems are yeah, but you're, I mean, you're describing me processes like, yeah, I know that the human body is the result of millions of years of evolution and not some fat guy drinking Mountain Dew and eating a bag of Cheetos while configuring some aspect of Kubernetes. Like, I know this, it's obvious. What I'm asking for is like an analogy or a corollary or like something that is similar but yeah i know it's not going to be exactly the same assume i'm an adult with a fair basic education i apologize for any confusion i understand your request for an analogy or corollary that draws a parallel between the human body and a computing concept here's a simplified analogy think of the human body's ability to adapt and compensate for organ failure as somewhat analogous to a self-healing or fault-tolerant computer system in most cases, self-healing computer system, just as the human body can detect and respond to issues like organ damage or malfunction, self-healing computer systems can identify and respond to faults or failures in hardware or software yeah, components. but like what does that? Redundancy. The presence of two kidneys in the human body provides redundancy, ensuring that essential functions continue if one kidney fails. Similarly, in a computer system, you can introduce redundancy by having backup servers or components that take over when the primary ones fail. Yeah, but why do Automatic they... failover. When one kidney fails, the body's autoregulation mechanisms help the remaining kidney take over the workload. Yeah, the, so... Similarly... So they... So the answer you're giving me is the body's auto regulation mechanisms. Like that's the correct answer for like, what is the human body equivalent, you know, in a analogous way, you know, just like making up things, not, you know, just helping me understand Kubernetes and container orchestration. So, like, the human body equivalent of that is auto-regulation mechanisms, correct? Yeah. Yes, you can consider the body's auto-regulation mechanisms as an analogous concept to the self-healing and auto-scaling capabilities in container orchestration and computing systems. Okay, well, tell me tell me more about the body's auto-regulation systems, or sort of mechanisms. The body's autoregulation systems or mechanisms refer to a set of physiological processes that help maintain internal stability and adapt to changes in various conditions. These mechanisms are crucial for ensuring that vital functions are maintained within a relatively narrow range, despite external factors or fluctuations. Here are some key examples of autoregulation systems in the human yeah. body. Blood pressure regulation. The body has mechanisms to regulate blood pressure and ensure that it remains within a healthy yeah. range. 
When blood pressure rises above normal, sensors in the blood vessels, baroreceptors, detect the change in sense signals to the brain. Fascinating. In response, the brain can trigger the dilation of blood vessels or slow down the heart rate to lower blood pressure. Okay, so for each of these body audio auto regulation systems, blood pressure, body temperature, blood sugar, respiratory rate, fluid and electrolyte balance, can you kind of draw an analogy to something like container orchestration or like you know technology can you like draw some sort of parallel between human physiology and technology certainly here's an attempt to draw analogies between the body's autoregulation systems and technology or container orchestration blood pressure regulation analogy load balancing and technology explanation load balancers and technology similar to baroreceptors in the body distribute incoming network traffic evenly across multiple servers or nodes when one server experiences high traffic, analogous to high blood pressure, the load balancer can redirect traffic to other healthy servers, ensuring that the overall system remains responsive and balanced. Body temperature regulation, analogy, cooling systems and data centers explanation, data centers employ cooling systems to maintain a stable operating temperature for yeah, servers yeah, and equipment. Yeah, 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 yeah. These systems are analogous to the body's cooling mechanisms. Sweat. Just as sweat helps cool the body, cooling yeah. systems dissipate heat generated by servers to prevent overheating. When the temperature rises, analogous to an increase in body temperature, cooling systems activate to maintain optimal conditions. Wow. Blood sugar regulation, analogy, resource management and cloud computing explanation. Cloud computing platforms allocate and manage be. resources dynamically based on application demand, similar to how the body regulates glucose oh, levels. Okay, yeah. When an application requires more resources, analogous to elevated blood sugar levels, the cloud platform can allocate additional computing resources. How does it do that? Conversely, during periods of low demand, resources are scaled down, similar to insulin helping cells absorb glucose. Okay. Respiratory rate adjustment, analogy, dynamic scaling in cloud and container orchestration explanation. In technology, dynamic scaling adjusts the number of server instances or containers based on workload. This is similar to how the body regulates the respiratory rate based on oxygen and carbon dioxide levels. When there is increased demand, analogous to elevated carbon dioxide levels, more server instances or containers are deployed. Conversely, during periods of low demand, instances are scaled down. Fluid and electrolyte balance, analogy, resource allocation and monitoring and ID infrastructure explanation. In ID infrastructure, resource allocation and monitoring are essential for maintaining performance. This is akin to how the body regulates fluid and electrolyte balance to ensure cellular function. Just as the kidneys adjust water and electrolyte levels as needed, ID systems allocate resources like memory and CPU to processes and monitor performance metrics to make real-time adjustments. These analogies highlight the similarities and principles between the body's autoregulation mechanisms and the adaptive and self-regulating capabilities found in technology, including container orchestration and resource management. While the specific mechanisms and contexts differ, the underlying concepts of adaptation, feedback loops, and resource optimization are shared between biological and technological systems. That's fascinating. A baroreceptor, also known as a pressure receptor, is a specialized sensory receptor or nerve ending that is sensitive to changes in blood pressure. Baroreceptors play a crucial role in regulating and maintaining blood pressure within a relatively narrow and optimal range to ensure that the body's vital organs receive an adequate blood supply. Here's how baroreceptors work. Location. Baroreceptors are primarily located in certain areas of the circulatory system, including the walls of the carotid arteries, located in the neck, and the aortic arch, located near the heart. These locations are strategically chosen because they are in close proximity to the heart and major blood vessels. Yeah. Sensory function. Baroreceptors are stretch-sensitive sensory nerve endings. When blood pressure increases, the walls of the arteries and blood vessels expand or stretch. Conversely, when blood pressure decreases, the vessel walls contract or recoil. Response to changes, baroreceptors continuously monitor changes in the stretching or distension of the arterial walls. If blood pressure rises or falls beyond a certain range, the baroreceptors detect these changes. Feedback mechanism, when baroreceptors detect an increase in blood pressure, they send signals to the brain, specifically to the medulla oblongata, which is part of the brainstem. This region of the brain processes and integrates the information from the baroreceptors. Adjusting blood pressure. In response to the signals from the baroreceptors, the brain can initiate changes in the body to regulate blood pressure. For example, if blood pressure is too high, the brain can send signals to the heart to slow down, causing a decrease in heart rate. It can also signal blood vessels to dilate, widen, reducing resistance to blood flow. These actions collectively help lower blood pressure back to the desired range. Baroreceptors are part of the body's autoregulation mechanisms that help maintain homeostasis, ensuring that vital organs receive an adequate blood supply while preventing blood pressure from becoming dangerously high or low. They play a critical role in short-term blood pressure regulation and can respond rapidly to changes, helping the body adapt to various physiological demands and environmental conditions. There's no barrel res Ah, that's annoying. Are there... Is that like an umbrella term? Is that why? I mean, this is probably... I I'm like super distracted, but this is kind of like the main thing I'm interested in now since the pandemic is like human health and physiology they don't have it all right well that's okay 
Okay, so I think um, I'm gonna. Oh, uh, that's yep. So I'll, I'll take a quick pause and I'll be uh, right back. All right, I'm back. I'm on my treadmill. I've got five minutes of active time here. So let's get back on track. Um, yeah, let, let's knock off another one of these videos. My friend Kelsey Hightower once said, containers are the price of admission to using Kubernetes. So to get started with Kubernetes, we'll need to dive deeper into what containers really are. With a whole universe of things to learn, it's important to start with the essentials. Let's go over the concepts that make Kubernetes usable, scalable, and just downright awesome. Are you ready? So uh, Kubernetes is a container orchestrator. Last time you said that containers were packaged up services, what does that actually mean? Yeah, containers Nothing. were built to deploy smaller services with isolation and consistency, but they're not actually a new concept. Containers are based on some underlying concepts from the Linux kernel, namespaces and C groups. Right, namespaces make sure that individual processes can't see the details of other processes, and C groups control how much resources a process can use, like CPU memory. These two concepts are all about giving a process isolation, protecting it from inter- See, see this, uh, this is why, like, mount, you know, we did that in um we did that in uh the lpic pid we did that in the in the lpic like uh user we did that in the in the lpic so yeah the lpic is is good <laughs> i just wouldn't throw you know all kinds of time and money at it um especially yeah i would do engineer kit instead which is what i'm doing Interfering with other processes, as well as protecting itself from other. Um. Oh, BLKIO. That kind of looks familiar. I wonder if some of this would show up in the LPIC-2, because I was making really good progress on the LPIC, so I kind of want to keep going on that. <laughs> Virtual machines can give a similar level of isolation, but only by packing the whole operating system with it. For plenty of applications, the OS isn't necessary and it certainly takes up a lot of resources. Containers, on the other hand, only focus on the application and its dependencies, making them... Yeah, so we learned about that in the LPIC, and that's like everywhere. That's something people want you to know. More lightweight. Now, apps don't need to worry about if some developer had hard-coded Python 2.7 into the path variable. That's an oddly specific example, but yes. There's actually a few different container runtimes, but one of the most popular is Docker. They built an API that helped app developers build containers and a platform to run them the same way, regardless of which machine they run on. Right, it's all about letting the app developer define what they want the runtime to look like instead of spending time messing around with the kernel. This is all done in a Docker file. Oh, why don't we zoom in on one? Good idea. If you were working on a simple Flask app, your Docker file might look like this. The first line is the base image the app should use. You can choose from all sorts of base images. So you can choose one that has exactly what you need with less overhead, making your container smaller. Next, these lines tell the container what commands to run when being initialized. Your Flask app is definitely gonna need Python, so this installs Python, pip, and Flask. Now the copy command will grab files from your local environment and copy them into the container. So your local app.py file gets copied to slash opt slash app.py, and the container now has your app files. And finally, the entry point command lets your container run as an executable, actually starting up the Flask application. With just a few lines, you've created a container. Awesome, but... But? But you would still have to manually deploy the container, manage it, and handle situations like if the container goes down or if you want to roll out an upgrade to your app code. And now we've come back to Kubernetes. Kubernetes takes care of managing your containers, no matter if you have one or a thousand. Just like how your Docker file explains what you want your container to do, you can configure Kubernetes for what you want your whole cluster to do. You might hear this called the desired state. And that's probably the coolest thing about Kubernetes. You tell it what the desired state for the cluster is, and it automates everything from pods, nodes, load balancers, and more. Whoa, uh, hold on, that's a lot of new stuff. Let's start with the essentials. We were just talking about containers. So what's a pod? A pod is like a collection of multiple containers, sort of a pseudo application. It could just be one app, or it could be multiple different ones that need to work together. For example, let's go back to your Flask app. Okay, so I know how to build a container. How do we turn this into a pod? Well, if that's your desired state, we can tell Kubernetes to make it happen. Here's a YAML file that gives the desired state for a pod. This metadata section gives a way for Kubernetes to group pods and other resources together, and we'll dive deeper into that later. For now, the key part is this spec section. Here's where you name the pod and tell it which image to use. Since this is a simple pod, your container is the only one running here. There's also a port section so the container can be accessed through the web on the default HTTP port 80. Once this config is put into a Kubernetes cluster, Kubernetes knows what you want to do and is in charge of ensuring that your actual state matches your desired state. That's a great start. Uh, but where is the pod actually going to run? For that, we'll need to talk more about nodes and deployments. Let's cover that in the next episode. Sounds good. So today we covered more about containers and why they became so popular. Then we started to talk about how Kubernetes works with containers, but there's still plenty more to cover. Wow, that was a lot of great info on containers, but now we need to figure out how they run. Okay, stay tuned, everybody. If you want to get hands-on, check out the link in the description. And if you enjoyed the episode, subscribe for more.
Yeah, this this is actually like really good. So, um, so let's see here. Uh, defining your container. How does it use containers? So, let me ask, uh, what are containers? Containers are a lightweight form of virtualization technology that allow you to package and run applications in their dependencies in isolated environments. See, it knows what we're talking Containers about. provide a consistent and reproducible way to package software, making it easier to deploy and manage applications across different computing environments. Key characteristics of containers include isolation, containers encapsulate an application and its dependencies, including libraries and configuration files, in a self-contained unit. This isolation ensures that an application and its dependencies do not interfere with other applications or the underlying system. Portability. Containers are highly portable and can run consistently across various platforms and environments, such as development laptops, testing servers, and production data centers. This portability is achieved through containerization standards like Docker. Efficiency. Containers are lightweight and share the host operating system's kernel, which reduces resource overhead compared to traditional virtual machines, PMs. As a result, containers can start quickly and consume fewer system resources. Versioning. Containers can be versioned, allowing you to track changes to an application over time. This helps with reproducibility and rolling back to previous versions if needed. Ease of deployment. Containers are easy to deploy using container orchestration tools like Kubernetes or Docker Swarm. These tools simplify application deployment, scaling, and management. Security. Containers offer a level of isolation and security, but it's essential to configure and manage them properly to maintain security best practices. Container security tools and practices are available to enhance container security. One of the most widely used containerization technologies is Docker, which popularized the concept of containers and introduced a standardized format for container images. Docker containers are portable and can run on various container runtimes and platforms. Containers have revolutionized the way applications are developed, deployed, and managed by enabling a consistent and efficient way to package and run software. They have become an integral part of modern software development and deployment practices, particularly in the context of microservices architectures and cloud-native applications. Okay, so we'll ask the next one. How do you define a container? How do you define a container? A container is a standalone, executable package that includes everything needed to run a piece of software, including the code, runtime, system tools, libraries, and settings. Oh. It encapsulates no, an application I'm and its dependencies in a consistent and isolated environment. No, that's not Containers are designed to be lightweight, portable, and efficient, making it easier to develop, package, and deploy software across different computing environments. Here's a concise definition of a container. A container is a self-contained unit that packages an application and its dependencies, allowing it to run consistently and reliably across different platforms and environments. No, I mean, like, specifically, what do you do on a computer in order to make a container? Do you put something in a CD-ROM drive? Do you type something into a notepad file? Like, what do you actually do to make a container? I apologize for any confusion. Creating and working with containers involves using specific containerization software, such as Docker, right. and typically doesn't involve physical CD-ROM drives or manual text editing exactly. and notepad files. Instead, you define and build containers using a combination of configuration files and commands in a terminal or command prompt. Exactly. Here are the general steps to create and use a container using Docker as an example. Install Docker. If you haven't already, you need to install Docker on your computer. Docker provides versions for various operating systems like Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. Once installed, the Docker software manages containers and images for you. Write a Docker file. The Docker file is a text-based configuration file that defines the instructions for building the container. I wish you could like, skip ahead to the next You create section. this file using a text editor, specifying the base image, application code, dependencies, and any required settings. It's similar to writing a script for creating your container. Build the container image. Once you have a Docker file, you use the Docker build command to build a container image based on the Docker file. This command compiles the necessary components into a container image. Run the container. After building the image, you can run it using the Docker run command. This starts a container instance based on the image you created. You can specify various options, such as port mappings and environment variables. Interact with the container. Once the container is running, you can interact with it as if it were a standalone environment. You can access its shell, execute commands, and manage its configuration. Stop and remove the container. When you're done using the container, you can stop it with Docker Stop and remove it with Docker Arm. This cleans up the resources associated with the container. These steps outline the basic process of creating and running a container using Docker. Other containerization technologies may have similar concepts and workflows, but might use different commands and configuration files. The key takeaway is that containers are created and managed using containerization software, and they don't require physical media like CD-ROMs or manual text editing and notepad files. Instead, they rely on defined configurations and command line operations. Okay. How does Kubernetes use containers? Kubernetes is a container orchestration platform that manages the deployment, scaling, and management of containerized applications. It leverages containers as the fundamental building blocks for running and encapsulating individual components of an application. Here's how Kubernetes uses containers. Container orchestration. Kubernetes abstracts away the underlying infrastructure and provides a unified platform for deploying and managing containerized applications. It uses containerization technology, typically Docker, to package applications and their dependencies into containers. Pods. In Kubernetes, the smallest deployable unit is called a pod. A pod can contain one or more containers. Containers within a pod share the same network namespace and can communicate with each other using mobile hosts. They also share the same storage volumes. Deployment and scaling. Kubernetes uses deployments, replica sets, and other controllers to define desired states for pods. You specify the number of replicas, instances, of a pod you want to run. Kubernetes continuously monitors the state of your application and makes adjustments to ensure that the desired number of pods are running. 
If a pod fails, it replaces it automatically. Service discovery and load balancing. Kubernetes provides services which are abstracted endpoints for pods. Services enable automatic load balancing and service discovery for containers. Services expose a stable DNS name and IP address to access the containers, regardless of which node they are running on. Scaling. Kubernetes support both manual and automatic scaling. You can scale the number of replicas up or down based on demand using commands or declared up configurations. Horizontal pod autoscaling, HPA, can automatically adjust the number of replicas based on CPU or custom metrics. Rolling updates and rollbacks, Kubernetes allows you to update applications with minimal downtime using rolling updates. New versions of containers are gradually deployed while old ones are phased out. If issues are detected during an update, Kubernetes supports easy rollbacks for previous versions. Configuration management, Kubernetes enables you to manage configuration data for containers using config maps and secrets, allowing you to separate configuration from the container image. Resource management, Kubernetes allows you to specify resource requests and limits for containers to control CPU and memory allocation. This ensures efficient resource utilization. Storage orchestration, Kubernetes provides storage options for containers, including persistent volumes, PDs, and persistent volume claims, PDCs, for managing data storage and stable applications. Network management, Kubernetes manages networking for containers, ensuring that containers can communicate with each other, be exposed to the internet, and access external services. In summary, Kubernetes leverages containers to provide a robust, scalable, and portable platform for deploying and managing containerized applications. Containers offer consistency and isolation, while Kubernetes provides the orchestration, automation, and management capabilities necessary to run complex, containerized workloads in production environments. Okay, so, um... What's what's the okay yeah that's good so let, let me ask one more question oh no that that that's it so I can go to the next video now there's really not that many videos today it's time to figure out how Kubernetes actually runs containers on nodes let's check it out with a whole universe of things to learn it's important to start with the essentials let's go over the concepts that make Kubernetes usable scalable and just downright awesome Are you now there there is there is a Kubernetes certification as well from what I understand. Yeah, so so there's a so introduction. Oh, so th this this is tied to the Linux Foundation. See, I'm thinking what I might want to do is get the lowest, easiest hanging cert in like every single. So here you get the cert materials. Do you get the actual cert? Oh, you get it for for a class. This is Linux Foundation. That's training. I don't, I don't care about the training. I, I want to know like what the actual. Oh, here it is. But I want to see. I don't care about the courses. I care about. Oh yeah. This, okay. Here we go. So there's all sorts of ones you can get. There's a lot of security ones. I think this one probably makes I hate how there's always like so many different ones. It's like I just want the one that matters and I don't want the ones that don't. Okay, so yeah, this this I'm actually going to bookmark this, I think. Now this is an associate, so there's also a administrator. Yeah, the administrator one is is $400. Um, so, so that's, that's depth. That's not breadth. Um, so yeah, I'm going to bookmark this. Um, actually I'm going to bookmark it in Chrome. I use two different browsers now. Oh, I am in Chrome. Okay. Whoops. Okay. So bookmark this, uh, and it's uh, to uh, uh, why can't I? Oh, here we go. Choose another folder career technical development certifications. Save okay. And I, I can uh, so this is this is um, this can go all the way to the bottom. Um, so mentorship is at the top right now, then technical development, um, then, uh, the jobs so that will be moved up later. 
um, whatever I'm doing with my LLC, which is like nothing. So that can, that can go to the bottom, just investing in stuff. Oh, well that's, that should go into finances. That should go into finances. Um, okay. Uh, so I, I want it to be in, um, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so let me, let me, uh, change this around. So this can go at the top now. Uh, let me open the bookmark manager. Okay, and then uh, we're gonna look at uh, technical development uh, certifications. And uh, oh, is it? Oh, whoops. Okay, I can't move it there. So L pick one goes all the way at the bottom. Uh, L pick two goes at the bottom as well. And cores at the bottom, <laughs> project management's at the bottom. Um, so the Kubernetes one is at the top. The AWS is at the top right now. Uh, oh, this one's still at the top. This one I don't know, but kind of at the bottom. Mist is at the top still. Um, this one should be at the top. Uh, Meraki. I don't know about Mar See, I don't know. I feel like you can choose between Meraki and Mist. Meraki probably makes more sense than Mist. I'll put it like, I'll put it like up here. DevNet might make sense as well. Okay. All right. This this good. So let's move on to uh, the next one here. Ready? So with all of our conversation about how pods run our containers, I figured it would make sense to talk about nodes, which means it's time to figure out what are nodes. That's an important. Topic. Uh, nodes are not pods because we learned about pods in the last uh, video. Topic. The simple way of looking at it is that a node is a virtual or physical machine that you run your workloads on. Wow, that's pretty straightforward. And I know that in Kubernetes, we operate on clusters, which are you know groups of one or more worker nodes. But in order to get the automation that Kubernetes provides, I'm sure nodes are more than just any old virtual or physical machine, right? Exactly. Each node actually contains the services necessary to run pods. A container runtime for running containers. Pods run on nodes. A kubelet for making sure that everything that should be running is. And the cube proxy for handling networking. Aha, so that's how Kubernetes keeps track of pods. That also explains how pods get IP endpoints and other necessary features for running at scale, like you know being able to attach to a running pod for debugging. Yep, now if we had to manually manage all of the pods on each node, it would be impossible to handle. That's one of the most important reasons Kubernetes exists. The way Kubernetes actually manages these pods is through what's called the control plane. The control plane is responsible for handling all of these details by exposing an API. This is where Kubernetes can define, deploy, and manage the lifecycle of our pods. Right, there's a lot going on in the control plane. Let's look at some of the components that make up the control plane and what they do. First, there's the API server itself, which handles data validation and configuration for all of the API objects. Next, there's etcd, which is a key value store for holding onto all the important data that Kubernetes uses. Plus, there's the scheduler. Here's where the important decisions get made about where exactly a pod will run. The scheduler can look at the available resources for all the nodes and make sure that a pod goes to a node that can handle it. And don't forget about the controller manager, where the core Kubernetes logic happens. One of the big responsibilities here is lifecycle management to make sure all the various pieces are working correctly. Similarly, there's the Cloud Controller Manager, which lets Kubernetes hook into cloud providers. So if you're running Google Kubernetes Engine, the Cloud Controller Manager is what speaks to Google Cloud when something is needed, like a new virtual machine for a node. Having that abstraction from dealing with the individual details of each cloud provider sure sounds nice. Wow, the control plane is responsible for a lot. But with all of that, how do you actually declare the details to Kubernetes? That's where the Kubernetes API comes in. Let's try it out in the next episode. So that's how Kubernetes does all the things that it does. If you're going to deploy a container, you'd make a pod that uses your container, you'd make sure Kubernetes has nodes, and then it, it figures out the rest. That's right. The kubelets on the nodes are watching what's going on on the node itself. So when the control plane needs to schedule a pod on that node, both the control plane and the node itself have enough information to make sure it works. Plus, if a pod runs into an issue, the control plane will work with the kubelet to remove the unhealthy pod and replace it with a new one. Wow, that was a lot of great info on nodes, but now it's time to take a deeper dive into the Kubernetes API. All right, stay tuned, everybody. If you want to get hands-on, check out the link in the description. And if you enjoyed the episode, subscribe for more. I do want to get hands-on. There's no, is this how you get hands on?
Hello from the floor of. Um. I thought there was a link in the description to get hands on. There isn't. I hate it when when that happens. And that's like that's like such a bad sign too cuz it's like it's like there's no it's like a sign of like problems in coordination and collaboration like he said there's going to be a link so like obviously he wasn't the guy responsible for this so like it's like he's just doing what he was told to do and then somebody else messed it up it's like and it makes him look bad because he's lying about there being a link All right. Well, uh, let's have a chat with uh, ChatGPT. Um, what is a node? In the context of Kubernetes and container orchestration, a node refers to a physical or virtual machine that is part of a Kubernetes cluster. Nodes are the individual compute units that run a containerized applications. Each node can be thought of as a worker machine responsible for hosting and executing containers. Here are the key components of node in Kubernetes cluster. Kubelet. Kubelet is an agent that runs on each node and communicates with the Kubernetes master. He is responsible for ensuring that containers are running in the pod, the smallest deployable unit in Kubernetes. Kubelet takes instructions from the master and starts, stops, or manages containers accordingly. Container Runtime The container runtime is the software responsible for running containers. Docker is a popular choice for the container runtime, but Kubernetes supports other runtimes like Container and Creo as well. Kube Proxy Kube Proxy is a network proxy that runs on each node. It maintains network rules on the host and forwards traffic to the appropriate containers or pods. Pods Pods are the smallest deployable units in Kubernetes. A pod can contain one or more containers that share the same network namespace, IP address, and storage volume. Containers within pod are co-located and can communicate with each other using mobile hosts. Containerized applications. Nodes host containerized applications within pods. These applications can be composed of one or more containers, and Kubernetes ensures that they are scheduled and managed across nodes in the cluster. Resources. Each node has its own set of CPU, memory, and storage resources. Kubernetes manages the allocation of these resources among the pods running on the node to ensure efficient utilization. Operating system. Nodes run an operating system, e. g. Linux, that provides the necessary infrastructure for running containers and Kubernetes components. Labels and annotations. Nodes can be labeled and annotated to provide metadata and information that can be used for node selection and scheduling decisions. This allows for custom node selection strategies and affinity, and affinity rules. Nodes are the foundation of a Kubernetes cluster, and they work together to run and manage containerized applications. The Kubernetes control plane, which includes the master nodes, communicates with worker nodes to schedule and monitor the execution of containers, these ensuring that applications great. are highly available and scalable. These, these are great uh, flashcards. Okay, great. Can you rewrite your answer in the form of closed deletion? Like, you know, closed deletion uh, flashcards. You know what I'm talking about. If you don't know what I'm talking about, the kind of, it's it's like C-L-O-Z-E, but if you don't know what I mean, ask me. Certainly. Here's the information in the form of closed deletion flashcards. A note in Kubernetes refers to a physical or virtual machine that is part of a Kubernetes cluster. Nodes are the individual compute units responsible for hosting and executing containers. On each node, you have the Kubelet, which is an agent that communicates with the Kubernetes master and ensures that containers are running in pod, which is the smallest deployable unit in Kubernetes. The container runtime, such as Docker, is responsible for running containers on each node. What is a closed deletion flashcard? A closed deletion flashcard is a type of flashcard used for learning and memorization. It's commonly associated with space repetition systems, SRS, a steady technique that helps users remember information more effectively over time. Closed deletion flashcards are a specific format of flashcards used in some SRS platforms like Unki. Here's how they work. Content. A closed deletion flashcard typically contains a sentence or statement with one or more words or phrases, in or closed, within the text. These in portions are usually enclosed in brackets or some other special notation. A closed deletion flashcard, often referred to as a closed card, is a type of flashcard used for learning and memorization, particularly in the context of language learning and comprehension. Okay, my my question about what? My question about Certainly, here's the information about what a oh, note perfect. is in the form of closed deletion flashcards. Closed deletion flashcard one, front side, in the context of Kubernetes and container orchestration, a note refers to a physical or virtual blank that is part of a Kubernetes cluster. 
Backside, A, note, refers to a physical or virtual machine that is part of a Kubernetes cluster. Closed Malaysian flashcard 2, front side, an if note, you have a blank, which is an agent that communicates with the Kubernetes master and ensures that containers are running in a pod, which is the smallest deployable unit in Kubernetes. Backside, an if note, you have a Qlib, which is an agent that communicates with the Kubernetes master and ensures that containers are running in a pod, which is... Alright, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna deal with that right now, though. Um, uh, let's just, let's keep this, knock off this video. Oh, it's, it's finished. It's time to look at the Kubernetes API and how it makes modeling the application lifecycle easier. With the whole I'm, I'm gonna get through all of these, um, and then, where are we at here? About the one hour mark. Um, I'm gonna get through all of them, and then I'm going to mark this as done, and then that will be the end of the video. Universe of things and I'll do the format of watching the video, and then asking the AI about each of these. Learn. It's important to start with the essentials. Let's go over the concepts that make Kubernetes usable, scalable, and just downright awesome. Are you ready? Kaslin, when it comes to what scalable applications need, we've talked about containers and nodes, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's plenty more we need in order to run a full scalable application. Exactly. And that's where the Kubernetes API comes in. It offers some really convenient primitives that make managing cloud native applications a lot easier. We've already talked about a few API objects like pods and nodes, but there's also services, deployments, secrets, and many more. That's a lot. Why don't we start simple and use an example application? We said that containers are the first step using Kubernetes, so let's start with this container I built to run my Hello app. This app is really simple. It just returns hello whenever I ping on its local IP and port 8080. So what next? Well, the first thing we have to do is to create some machines or nodes to run your application on. Got you. Okay, I'll use Google Kubernetes Engine to quickly get started. I can just use the gcloud command line tool to provision a Kubernetes cluster. After a few minutes, we'll have a cluster that's all ready to go. And by default, it comes with three nodes. This is a great starting point, but now we need to actually run my app. So how do we do that? Since we're using the command line, we can use a handy tool called kubectl to help interact with the Kubernetes API. Don't worry, we'll go into kubectl in more detail later, but we're keeping it simple, remember? What about all these other tools I've heard of? Uh, kube control, kube cuddle, kube ectl? There are a lot of different ways to pronounce the name of this tool, so whatever works for you. Anyway, this command is actually going to create a Kubernetes API object called a deployment. A deployment is an abstraction that manages the lifecycle of an application. I can set the desired number of app instances for the deployment to manage, and then it will make sure the correct number of instances, or replicas, are running. Exactly. So if we increase the number of replicas that we want, the deployment will see that there's currently not enough replicas and spin up another one. That even works when a node crashes. If the node goes down, the current state is once again different from the desired state, and Kubernetes will schedule another replica for us. Awesome. Now I know my app is running on these nodes, how do I access it? For that, we'll have to create a service. This creates an endpoint that we can use to access the running app instances. In this case, we have multiple app instances. So this service will load balance incoming requests between the two running pods. That's right. For any container inside of the cluster, they can connect to my service using the service's name. Either way, the service keeps track of wherever the pod is running. That's another example of how Kubernetes removes the need to manually keep track of where your containers are running. Even if a pod were to go down, once a new one comes back online, the service will automatically update its list of endpoints to target the new pod. So Kubernetes objects like deployments and services automatically ensure that we have the right number of app instances running through pods and that we can always reach them. This seems like it would allow for some really cool features. Yes, features that used to have to be manually coded just become afterthoughts when using Kubernetes. For example, deployments make things like rolling updates really simple. Whoa, you're saying that we can edit the deployment and watch the version of the applications gradually change? So let's say we have three replicas, and, and I want to put out a new version of my application that returns by instead of hello. You're saying I can update my application container, watch as the new version is gradually rolled out, and the deployment will bring up new application instances and start rerouting traffic to them? Then once the desired number of new instances are online, the old application instances are taken offline? This would mean this approach has zero downtime since Kubernetes is incrementally updating old pod instances with new ones. Exactly right. And a feature like that, plus the ability to quickly roll back if necessary, and keeping track of deployment histories and more, all of that is just built into Kubernetes. That's a large part of what makes it such a great tool to build other systems and applications on top of. The Kubernetes API really does make it easy to manage the application lifecycle. Uh, the basic primitives, pods, service, deployments, plus a few more we'll talk about soon, allow sysadmins and developers to focus on the app without having to worry about managing it at scale. But one thing I noticed is that we used an imperative approach. We made manual commands instead of using a declarative approach, which is one of the big appeals of Kubernetes. Great catch. Next episode, let's dig into that. We'll use Kubernetes the way it was intended to be used, by updating config files. Starting with an example monolith, we'll break it up into a microservices style architecture. This will also let us introduce some of the other core primitives that we didn't talk about, like labels and secrets. We're going to pair code up a microservice version of this? Hmm. OK, stay tuned, everybody. Next time, we'll be exploring building a basic Kubernetes app from scratch. In the meantime, if you want to get hands-on, check out the link in the description. And if you enjoyed the episode, subscribe for more. There's no link in the description. All right. Well, anyways, um, so so let's 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 say what are Kubernetes API objects? What are Kubernetes API objects?
In Kubernetes, API objects are the fundamental building blocks used to represent and manage the state of your containerized applications and the desired state of the Kubernetes system itself. These objects are defined in the Kubernetes API, application programming interface, and they serve as the configuration and operational units of a Kubernetes cluster. API objects are used to specify how applications should run, how they should scale, and how different parts of the system should interact. Here are some common Kubernetes API objects. Pod. A pod is the smallest deployable unit in Kubernetes. It represents a single instance of a running process and cluster. Pods can contain one or more containers, and they share the same network and stored namespace. Service. Services define a set of pods and provide a consistent endpoint for accessing them. They are used for load balancing and service discovery within a cluster. Replica set. A replica set ensures that a specified number of identical pods are running at any given time. It provides scaling and self-healing capabilities by creating or deleting pods as needed. Deployment. A deployment is a higher-level abstraction that manages replica sets. It enables declarative updates to applications and provides features like rolling updates and rollbacks. Stateful set. Stateful sets are used for managing stateful applications that require stable network identities in order to deployment. Namespace. Namespaces are virtual clusters within a physical cluster. They provide a way to divide and isolate resources and objects within a Kubernetes cluster. Config map and secret. Config maps and secrets are used to manage configuration data and sensitive information like passwords and API keys, which can be used by containers and pods. Persistent volume and persistent volume claim. These objects are used to manage persistent storage in a cluster, allowing pods to access and use external storage resources. Service account. Service accounts are used to provide permissions and access control for pods and containers running in the cluster. Ingress. Ingress objects define rules for routing external traffic to services within the cluster. They can be used for load balancing and routing based on HTTP, HTTPS rules. Custom resource definitions, CRDs, CRDs allow you to define custom resources and controllers to extend Kubernetes capabilities and create custom objects specific to your applications. These are just some examples of Kubernetes API objects. Each object has a specific purpose and configuration, and they can be combined to define and manage complex applications and services within a Kubernetes cluster. The Kubernetes API provides a standardized way to interact with and manage these objects using tools like Kubigal or programmatically through API clients. All right, so uh, I didn't really get the last of this, but um, that's okay. But isn't this cool? Like you can get, um, so, uh, okay, rewrite it in the form of, so please rewrite in the form of Certainly, here are the Kubernetes API objects presented in the form of closed deletion flashcards. Closed deletion flashcard 1, front site, in Kubernetes, API objects are the fundamental building blocks used to represent and manage the state of your containerized applications and the desired state of the Kubernetes blank itself. Back site, in Kubernetes, API objects are the fundamental building blocks used to represent and manage the state of your containerized applications and the desired state of the Kubernetes system itself. Closed deletion flashcard 2, front site, a, blank, is the smallest deployable unit in Kubernetes. It represents a single instance of a running process and cluster. Pods can contain one or more containers and share the same network and stored namespace. Back site, a pod is the smallest deployable unit in Kubernetes. It represents a single instance of a running process and cluster. Pods can contain one or more containers and share the same network and stored namespace. Closed deletion flashcard 3, front site, blank, to find a set of pods and provide a consistent endpoint for accessing them. They are used for load balancing and service discovery within cluster. Back site, services define a set of pods and provide a consistent endpoint for accessing them. Man, these are so good. They are used for load balancing and service discovery within cluster. Closed deletion flashcard 4, front site, replica set ensures that a specified number of identical pods are running at any given time. It provides scaling and self-healing capabilities by creating or deleting pods as needed. It is often managed by high- I like that. Okay, so uh, let's go on to the next one. And now we put it all together. If you missed the last four episodes, check them out, link below. But for those of you who haven't, let's check out how to get started with Kubernetes. With the whole universe of things to learn, it's important to start with the essentials. Let's go over right. the concepts that make Kubernetes usable. With the whole universe of things to learn, that's, that's so true. Start with the essentials, <laughs> whatever those are. Scalable and just downright awesome. Are you ready? Hey, Kaslin, thanks for joining me in this culminating video. Before we talked about containers and some other things, but it was mostly theoretical. It would be great to see an example in action. What do you think? Yeah, sounds good to me. You remember in the last episodes how we talked about containers and deploying those containers onto Kubernetes? Yeah, I went back, I rewatched all the old episodes. We talked about nodes, we talked about containers, and we even talked about the basic Kubernetes API objects. But one thing was we deployed everything imperatively, which you said wasn't going to scale well, right? Right. So this time, I'm going to show you how to deploy an app declaratively. Great. I can't wait to see how it works. And that's that's the difference of, uh, I forget, procedurally, I, I don't remember. Now, we're going to explore how to deploy applications and containers declaratively using Kubernetes. If you remember in the last video, we talked about deployments in Kubernetes and how to create them. But the command that we used in our last video to create a deployment was imperative. We told Kubernetes exactly what we wanted it to do, and it did it. In the real world, we don't really want to do things that way. We want to do things declaratively by having a file that describes or declares what we want things to be like. And then we have Kubernetes do the hard work of figuring out how to make that happen. 
Having our state defined declaratively in files allows us to do some cool things, like make changes to our deployments by just changing the file describing it. We can also track those changes through source control and make use of great tools for deploying applications at scale, like continuous integration and continuous deployment tools. Oh, so to start with, up. let's create a deployment like we did in the last video, but this time we'll do it declaratively. Yeah, I see I've tried to do this before, but I've, I've actually heard uh, that that uh, if you if you, for like 30 bucks, you can get the the experience and skills you need to like get you know the, the return on investment for like a $30 project is like insane so like there is going to be have to be a point where I get over my aversion to just putting my credit card everywhere and I can make a virtual card too and and delete that if things aren't going my way but um see I, i'm just i'm just kind of worried that w what i'll do is yeah I'm, I'm just you know i'm i'm one of the i'm fiscally <laughs> i'm good with money <laughs> i don't just throw it everywhere I, well that's not true anymore right? it used to be <laughs> well anyway what i'm saying is is i if i'm going to give them my credit card I want I want to be I don't want to just gamble and, and throw things away. At the same time, if it's literally going to be like thirty dollars, and the return on investment will be like thirty thousand dollars at the end of the year, like yeah, and I've I've heard that that you know that can be the case. So like, <sighs> on the one hand, it's a no brainer, and at some point, I definitely just need to forfeit over my credit card. And put some charges on it, thirty dollars at most, you know, and uh, you know the return on investment on that is going to be insane. But uh, on the other hand, I'm just worried that I'll spend the thirty dollars. Uh, something will happen where I spend more than I was intending, and it just it goes nowhere. So here you can see that I'm in Google Cloud Platform. And I'm using the Cloud Shell terminal to interact with a Kubernetes cluster that I have already created. And if I run ls here, you'll see that I'm in a directory that has some subdirectories and some files. So the files for my microservice application uh, that I'm going to need to create that microservice application in Kubernetes are all in these directories. So the first one that I'm going to look at is deployments hello.yaml. So in this case, I have all of my files separated by the type of uh, Kubernetes resource that they define. You could do this in all sorts of ways. You don't have to do it with this structure or anything. It's just the way that it is here. Uh, so let's take a look at this. If you remember the last video, uh, we had to tell Kubernetes what it was that we wanted it to create, which is a deployment in this case. So we're doing that again here. We're giving that deployment a name. We're telling Kubernetes a number of replicas uh, that we want of the pods that will be in this deployment. You remember that we went over those as well. And so here we're defining the actual container that we're going to be running, the container image, and a bit more information about that. And you'll also see down here we have a liveness probe and a readiness probe, which we didn't really go over last time, um, but they are tools that Kubernetes provides to help make sure that your application is up and ready to receive traffic. Uh, so there's a bit more that you can learn about deployments. As you can see, this is a fairly, uh, not really that long, but there are a few components in it that are worth learning a bit more about. So if you want to look into deployments a bit more, I'd recommend it. So this is what we mean by declaring our desired state. All of the information about what we want this deployment to look like is here in this file. And if we wanted to make a change, like uh, changing the image that we're going to be running in this deployment, we could do that in this file and we could track that change through source control. So the next thing I'm going to do, actually, I want to look at one more file before I create anything. So let me look at, within services, I have another file called hello.yaml. So if you remember from the last video, we created our deployment with our application, but then we needed some way to reach our application. And we did that by creating a Kubernetes service. So this is uh, what this is going to do. This is creating another Kubernetes service that will allow us to connect to our Hello application, uh, which will be deployed in its own deployment. So this service definition is pretty simple. It just has a name for the service. It uh, has a selector, which tells the service how to find the backends that it is serving. And then it has some port information that will allow us to actually reach that application. So if I want to create these, there's some buy skills right there. And I wanted to do it in a declarative way. What I'm going to do is run kubectl apply dash f. Although she didn't do, she didn't do uh, uh, zz. And give it the file name. So let's say deployments hello.yaml. And I can do more than one at a time. I can just add another dash f here. 
and specify my service and create my service at the same time. So that's pretty cool. The kubectl apply command doesn't know which API object you're creating, so you can specify it in the file and then just give it those files. So it's pretty versatile. So let's go ahead and create those. So you can see that my deployment and my service were created. But it wouldn't be a microservice application if it wasn't split up into multiple services. So the next service that I'm going to deploy, I'm going to deploy in exactly the same way. I'm going to do kubectl apply, dash f, and then grab another deployment. And this time I'm going to deploy my front end. .yaml. So for this application, I've added in an Nginx server, which will act as my front end. And by the way, if you want to try this stuff out for yourself and follow along or just kind of uh, play around with it, check out the links below. We'll have some information. We'll have a place where you can send us money. And it's still not in the links below. Liars! Oh, oh, oh wait, wait, wait. Is this it? Now it's an article. And this is... This is a uh, conversation. Well, I mean, do they have like a, I don't want to spend. Uh. information for you to get hands on with this. So we're going to run kubectl apply uh, and we'll give it the file for our front end deployment. And once again, we're going to need a service for that. Uh, so let's create our front end.yaml service as well. Now, an interesting thing here is I'm using the kubectl apply command because if uh, that resource doesn't exist, the apply command will go ahead and create the resource. So I didn't have a front end deployment or a front end service before. Uh, so it went ahead and created those. But if I were to run this command again, you'll see that it says that the front end and uh, the deployment and its service were unchanged. So if we were to make a change to our deployment, like I said earlier, we were to update the uh, container image or something like that in our uh, deployment file where we have declared what we want our deployment to look like, then we would be able to just apply that change. And in the case of deployments, there are settings uh, within Kubernetes that you can use to tell it how to roll out that change when you apply a new change. Uh, so in that way, this is a very declarative way uh, to create resources in Kubernetes. In what way? I wasn't paying attention. But now that I have an Nginx component to my application, there are some configuration, uh, there's some configuration information that I want to pass into my Nginx server. And it didn't really make sense to add that stuff into the container definition. And it didn't really make sense to add that at any point along the way in creating the Kubernetes deployment. So how am I going to get that configuration information into my Nginx server now? You're not. Luckily, Kubernetes has a tool for that called config maps. A config map lets you map your configuration information to your application running in a Kubernetes deployment. I already have a file here, uh, which has the configuration information that I need for my Nginx. Vice skills, vice skills alert. Front end, and it's in uh, Nginx frontend.conf. So you can see here that this is a bunch of configuration information for my Nginx uh, front end, but you'll see that it's not in YAML farm. So this is not actually declaratively declared. Look at that, look at that seamless exiting from Vi. That's good stuff. So I'm going to have to create this uh, just using the configuration file as it is. So what I'm going to do is run kubectl create config map uh, is the type of uh, Kubernetes object that I want to create. And I'm going to give that a name, which I'm just going to call it nginx frontend conf. And I'm going to tell it I want it to create that config map from a file with information file, <laughs> which is nginx slash frontend.conf. So this will go ahead and create the config map from that configuration information that I showed you a minute ago. But I have another problem. I want to run this application a bit more securely, and I want to use TLS with it. But for that, I'm going to need to pass it some TLS certs, which I don't really want to pass in a config map because that information is just kind of uh, plain text. I want to make sure that that information is kept more, well, secret. <laughs> so Kubernetes has a great tool for this called Secrets. Now, there are a lot of different tools for passing sensitive information in Kubernetes, so Kubernetes secrets might not be the best tool for your use case. You'll have to do a little bit of research to figure it out. Uh, but in my case, Kubernetes secrets are going to be just fine. They'll encrypt the information that I'm passing into my application, so let's go ahead and create a secret to pass my uh, application the TLS certs that I have for it. So kubectl create is what I'm going to use again. Secrets are very similar to config maps, except they're for secret information. So create a secret. And there are a few different types of secrets, but for this one, I'm just going to create a generic one. 
and I'm going to give it a name, TLS certs, and I'm going to create that once again from a file. And that will be the TLS certs that I have uh, in my directory. So that secret was created. And now there's one more piece of my microservice application. And that is an authentication uh, tool that I've added into the microservice. So what that's going to look like is once again, coming back to that trusty kubectl apply dash F, and I'm going to grab a service for my auth.yaml component of my microservice. And of course, I'm going to need something for that service to serve, which will be a deployment once again. And uh, that's going to be auth.yaml as well. And I appear to have mistyped something. Oh, let's see if we can figure out what it is. So I, I think, um, I think she forgot to do something in between here. She has to do another dash F. I think she forgot the second dash F. Oh, I didn't put a dash F. Yeah. My deployment. Hey, I'm, I'm, um, uh, yeah, I win. I win. My prize is to sign up for Google Cloud service, give them my credit card, and charge up like $30 on my, that I pay. So you do have to put a dash F for each file that you're passing in. So there you go. You can see that I've gone on ahead and created the service and the deployment for my authentication component of my microservice. And that's it. That's my whole microservice that I'm going to be showing you today. Uh, but how do I make sure that it's working properly? Well, the best way is always to test, right? So I'm going to run kubectl get uh, services, or just SBC for short. And I want to get the information for my front end. So you'll see that my front end service is of type load balancer. In this case, that means that it created an actual load. See, that's that's good. That's that's actually good. I like that there's this practical example. So yeah, this is this is where you actually go. Um, yeah, it's got the cluster IP. It's kind of like NAT. You can think of it like that. What? So good stuff. Balancer resource in Google Cloud. And you can see why this is so, you know, it's like I learned, I went to tech school for two years in 2013 is when I started, like 10 years ago. It's like we learned about NAT and like we learned about internal networks, external networks, you know, like inside local, outside global. But the the inside local or whatever you know that wasn't a cluster <laughs> so like you can see how um how different things are now it's like i just feel like i mean a lot it's, it's all it's all important to know but it's like this is uh this is the the stuff that's here now cloud and that external kind of load balancer resource uh, has created an external IP for us that we will actually be able to use to reach the application that I've uh, created. Yeah. So I'm going to copy that IP and I'm going to export it as a variable just to make my following commands a little bit easier. External IP and give it that number. Okay. So I. And this is this is an environment variable, so it looks different than what's up here. This is like the standard syntax for environment variables and and see this export command you know this is that lpic was actually really awesome because i i remember this like so yeah the lpic was great there's so many things in here that just like if you have that lpic it's like it, it's such a breeze to follow along with this i've created my variable so now i can run a curl command to test to make sure that my application is running correctly and if you'll remember earlier, uh, we incorporated some security capabilities into this application. But let's say that I just curled uh, that that IP. What would happen? Actually, I'm just going to paste it in, even though I just did that. <laughs> yeah, so, it's like the same number of characters. Right? But if I curl that, nothing happens. Why is that? <laughs> uh, why is that? Uh, because it's not it's not running. Of course, it's because we uh, set up TLS and we set up um, some security measures. So oh, now okay. sorry, I was wrong. Yeah, and, and it is running. It's been running for about six minutes. Now we're going to have to connect to this application using HTTPS a bit more securely. So I'm going to run curl dash k uh, HTTPS colon slash slash and give it that IP. And there you go. Uh, so we've got our message output of hello. And that's all I expected this application to do. So I know that the application is up and running properly. But I also incorporated this authentication capability. And so I can also connect to this application as a specific user and um, make use of it that way. So for that, I'm going to have to get a token to log in as a specific user. So what that's going to look like 
already did it. So I'm going to go ahead and enter the password for the user. So what you can see here is I set up a token, which uh, equals a curl command, logging yeah, in. Yeah, see this? User. See this? Like, the L pick is so good. Like, I know what she did. She converted the standard output of this command to standard input through this syntax here, dollar sign, open paren, and then we don't see the closed paren because uh, it's behind her photo. And defined the, defined the uh, output as input fed to the environment variable. Like the LPIC, the foundations, like the, that is like see how much of a breeze this is to follow along like you know she's she's an ass i think she's the kind of person too that would have a hard time knowing what other people don't know because people following along with this and going into vi are not going to be getting out of vi i'm grabbing the, the token from that login i had to enter the password for that user and so now i have this token that i can use to access the website as well so now I'm going to go ahead and run a curl command uh, where I am passing in that token. So I'm logging in as a specific user. And if I run that, I get the same result. So I know that. Yeah. So now, now she um, called that uh, IP. I can uh, reach yeah. my application uh, by using this authorization uh, capability that I added in. So cool stuff. I went through and I created deployments and config maps and secrets and for the deployments and the services, I did it in a declarative way using these files that I can then go in and make changes to, track those changes, and do a lot of really cool stuff with automation and running applications at scale. So this is going to be really useful. Great. So that's how I can run my application declaratively. Right. Running things declaratively is really useful in the real world. Running your deployments based on a file makes it easy to set up CICD, source control, and other processes that are useful for running applications at scale. Wow. Thanks to Kaslin for taking the time to show me how this all works. This wraps up to his suit the most basic Kubernetes objects. Next time, we'll start looking at a more advanced- Oh, we're doing the, hand, the down and dirty, hands-on. Um, so don't wear a suit for that. It's use cases and features of Kubernetes. Stay tuned. Oh, and be sure to follow along in the code lab link below to walk through this code if you want to get hands-on. And if you enjoyed this episode- Yeah, follow the link below. Yeah, okay. Subscribe for more. All right, that was pretty good though. So let me have a conversation with ChatGPT. So I'm gonna say, show me an example of Kubernetes deployment. Show me an example of Kubernetes deployment. This is so, so cool. Here's an example of a Kubernetes deployment configuration in YAML format. A deployment is used to manage the desired state of a set of replica pods and provides features like rolling up bits and rollbacks. In this example, API version and time specify the Kubernetes API version and resource type, respectively. Metadata contains metadata about the deployment, such as its name. Spec defines the desired state of the deployment. Replica specifies that we want three replicas pods for the application. Selector defines how pods managed by this deployment are selected using labels. Template specifies the pod template for creating the pods. Metadata sets labels for pods created by this template. Spec describes the POD specification, including containers. Containers lists the containers to run, in this case, a single container named Nginx container, using the Nginx list Docker image. Port specifies that the container exposes port 80. To create this deployment, you can save the YAML configuration to a file E. G. Nginx deployment. YAML, and then apply it using the kubectl command. This will create the deployment and Kubernetes will ensure that three replicas of the Nginx container are running. You can use various kubectl commands to manage and monitor the deployment, such as scaling the number of replicas, updating the container image, and more. That's good stuff. I love how it, it just, it's like so good. And and it's it hasn't been like any less accurate like it it's been it's been better than like what's in here like it's i'm blown away right now my mind is in a puddle on the floor show me an example of a kubernetes service certainly here's an example of a kubernetes service configuration in yml format a service is used to expose a set of pods as a network service within the cluster, enabling load balancing and service discovery. In this example, API version and time specify the Kubernetes API version and resource type, respectively. Metadata contains metadata about the service, such as its name. Spec defines the desired state of the service. Selector specifies the label selector and match pods that should be part of the service. Pods with the label app, Nginx, will be included. Port specifies the ports to expose within the service. Protocol specifies the protocol, TCP in this case. Port is the port to listen on within the service. Target port is the port to forward traffic to in the pods. Type defines the type of service. In this example, it's set to cluster IP, which creates an internal-only service. Other types include node port, load balancer, and external name for different use cases. 
To create the service, you can save the YAML configuration to a file, E, G, Nginx service, YAML, and then apply it using the kubectl command. This will create the service, and Kubernetes will ensure that it routes traffic to the pods with the label app, Nginx on port 80. You can use kubectl to access and manage the service, and other components within the cluster can reach the pods via the service's IP address. Alright. Talk about declarative Kubernetes with K-U-B-E-C-T-L apply. Declarative Kubernetes management with Kubectl apply is a fundamental approach to defining and maintaining the desired state of resources within a Kubernetes cluster. It allows you to specify your cluster's configuration in declarative YAML or JSON files and then apply those files to the cluster using the Kubectl apply command. This method of managing Kubernetes resources is a core principle of Kubernetes operations. Here's how declarative Kubernetes management with Kubectl apply works. YAML or JSON configuration files. You start by creating YAML or JSON files that describe the desired state of the Kubernetes resources you want to manage. These resources can include deployments, services, config maps, secrets, and more. Each resource is defined as a Kubernetes API object and file. Declaration of intent. These configuration files serve as a declaration of your intent. You specify what you want the cluster to look like based on your application's requirements. For example, you might declare that you want three replicas of a particular application deployed with specific settings. Item component operations. When you use Kubectl apply to apply these configuration files, Kubernetes examines the current state of the cluster and determines what actions are needed to make the cluster match to the declared state. Importantly, this process is item bone, meaning that applying the same configuration multiple times won't have unintended side effects. Automatic resource management. Kubernetes will create, update, or delete resources as necessary to achieve the desired state. If a resource already exists and matches the declared state, it won't be changed. If there are differences, Kubernetes will perform updates accordingly. Rolling updates and rollbacks. Declarative management with Kubectl apply supports rolling updates and rollbacks seamlessly. You can update the configuration files with new desired states, and Kubernetes will automatically manage the transition while maintaining application availability. If issues arise, you can easily roll back to a previous state. Version control and collaboration. Declarative configuration files can be stored in version control systems like Git. This enables versioning, collaboration, and tracking changes to your cluster's configuration over time. Infrastructure as code, IEC. Declarative Kubernetes management is considered a form of infrastructure as code, IEC. It treats infrastructure configuration as code, making it easier to automate, test, and maintain. Using Kubectl apply with declarative configuration files is considered a best practice for managing Kubernetes resources because it provides a clear and predictable way to manage the cluster state. It simplifies operations, promotes consistency, and helps ensure that the cluster aligns with your application's requirements. Example of using Kubectl apply. In this example, my app deployment. YAML is a declarative configuration file describing a deployment. Running this command will create or update the deployment in the cluster to match the state defined in file. Okay, so I got another question for it. I'm doing um, some grip training here. So. Nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty. All right, there we go. And I, I can show what, while I'd have to. Um, uh, you know what? I, I, I can do that. Let me, let me do this. Okay. So. Oh wait, no, 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 no. The, the, I'll, I'll, I'll ask the uh, next question. So. Show me an example of adding configuration info with config maps. Show me an example of adding configuration info with config maps. Certainly, here's an example of creating a config map in Kubernetes to store configuration information using YAML format. In this example, API version and kind specify the Kubernetes API version and resource type, which is a config map in this case. Metadata contains metadata about the config map, including its name, which is making config in this example. That is where you define key value pairs to store configuration data. Each key corresponds to a configuration parameter, and the associated value contains the actual configuration value. You can define as many key value pairs as needed to store various configuration parameters. In this example, we have defined three parameters, database underscore URL, avi underscore key, and max underscore connections, each with its respective value. To create this config map, you can save the YAML configuration to a file, e, g, my config map, yaml, and then apply it using the kubectl apply command. After creating the config map, you can reference its values in pods or other Kubernetes resources by mounting the config map as a volume or by using environment variables. For example, you can mount the config map data as a volume in a POD's YAML configuration. In this example, we create a pod named my app pod with a container that mounts the config map data as a volume with the path, etc. config inside the container. This allows the application running in the container to access the configuration data stored in the config map. By using config maps, you can centralize and manage your application configuration separately from the application code, making it easier to update and maintain configurations across multiple pods and environments. Oh. 20, 21. 
30. Okay. And I, I can I can show what I'm doing because it's uh, I started the video off with um, with uh, exercise stuff because you know that is like one of the biggest challenges for someone in IT working with computers. Your job is to sit in front of a computer all day. So all right, so I'll I'll just demo what I'm doing because that might be it's it's off topic, but. I'm go so I'm gonna demo. I'm gonna do a quick uh, fitness demo because this is really important. So I'm starting the uh, camera. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's the camera. So what I just finished doing is I have these. These are these are like rubber bands that you can put your finger in. Um, this is the lightest one. So the exercise I just. So so this is this is normally the exercise you would do with them. Is you'd put all your all your fingers in it like this and then you open your hand three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve and then you do it with the other hand one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven 12 and then um you can do you can do more than just that now i have different strengths as well this is this one is is a lot uh stronger um i have some that are weaker i also have uh matching strengths so i think these are these are matching strengths so you can do it with both hands and save some time um another another one i like to do is uh you give a you give a thumbs up like this and then you go one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve you feel that a little bit more on the top of the arm than with the other one kind of in a, a little bit of a different I mean, there's there's all kinds of it's one of the most muscular dense parts of the body so like if you vary it up you're gonna hit different parts one two three four five six seven eight nine 10 11 12 and then with that one you keep you keep the thumb still with the other one you you move the thumb out like that so that's uh one of the th set of exercises that i do um the next one and uh, 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 okay and then of course i have my i have my um and the coolest thing about these is um uh, you can do them you can do them on the uh, treadmill. Yeah. So now I'm on my treadmill and I, without even skipping a beat, I can keep doing the exercises. So the next one, you can see how much progress I've made. Uh, I'm on the heavy actually. Uh, there's the, I also have an extra heavy. And uh, I like to do uh, 15 unique motions on this and then end it with repeating the first motion. So it's uh, all together, one at a time. <sighs> all combinations of two at a time. Okay, then all combinations of three at a time. And then all together, and I'm done. So that's uh, 16 different presses. So let's do it with the left. One, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. And yes, I have made a lot of progress, a lot of rapid progress. You will not be able to do it with the heavy, I guarantee you. You might not even be able to do it with the light. Uh, when I started, the light was hard <laughs> for me. Um, but I made a lot of really fast progress with this, which which is awesome. Um, so yeah, th that was impressive. Do not expect to be able to do that. But that that one's a fun one. The other one I like to do is, and this I made a lot of rapid progress on as well. Uh, there's been some mixed reviews, but me, I kind of have uh, 
beefier arms so they it it really like fits well um and not in a good way <laughs> beefy in a bad way so you can see I've, I've got it maxed out and i actually added some extra rubber bands so this one you go one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve and you got to use bodybuilder technique, which that really wasn't, but sometimes, I mean, doing it is better than not doing it. Bodybuilder technique would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. All right, and so that that's a good one. Um, the other one I like to do with this, and this is really hard too. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight, eight is like the most I can do. That that one's really hard. One, two, three four, five, six, seven, eight. There we go. And these are just all, you know, small things that just fit right on my desk. So I just have them right on my desk. I'm on the treadmill too. It doesn't matter. I can do it on or off the treadmill. And then the last thing I, I like to do that I've been doing consistently is these classic ones. I'm sure most people have seen these. So this is the 150, believe it or not. So I like to do one, two, three, all the way down. Four, uh, four is all I can do. <laughs> it's kind of uh, one, two, three, four. So that's the 150 is a bit much for me. I'm better off with the 100. I could only find it in uh, 50 increments. I've got 200 here. I can't, and you can see I can't I can't even squeeze it at all so if, if, if so this this is what starting off I was like that with the 50 so I made a lot of really awesome rapid progress so this, this is the 100 this is the one that's more reasonable so one two three four five six six one two three four five six and then you can turn it around too and it kind of affects different muscles a little bit. One, two, three. Three is all I can do. One, two, three. Okay, and be careful not to get injured doing this. If you really crank on it and be like, oh, I can get it, you, something's gonna pop. These are delicate parts, uh, so treat them as such. It's, don't overdo it. Um, it's about gradual improvement over time. It's not about you, you have nothing to prove and you have everything to lose through an injury. So be careful with it. Use the right technique. And I want to show one final tool. All right. So here's the last tool. This is a grip X. And what this does is it shows you your grip strength. So if you hit start on it, it will calibrate. All right. And then you squeeze it. So 90.6, I'm, I'm still in recovery. I've pulled over a, a like 115. Uh, 89, so I'm pulling about a 90 right now. That's, uh, and I can have sedentary time. I will take the sedentary time. All right, um, so yeah, I'm pulling about a 90 right now, which is kind of what I pull when I'm uh, gassed, <laughs> which I'm gassed. Uh, it's kind of cool because I can feel my strength change a lot. I, I'm the kind of guy where it takes me a long time to recover. Like, you know, this is, this is like, you know, for me to really feel strong, I just, I have to do absolutely nothing. I have to be completely sedentary for like a full day. And then I get really bad muscle soreness as well. So I can pull like a, 
110, 115 on this thing, but only if I'm really, really well recovered and well rested. But uh, yeah, that that's everything. I have I have some more. Um, I have this thing, which is kind of like a hedge clippers. I've never really used it. It's just the the bigger, the bulkier things. It's like you know, this is big and bulky. It's just not that fun to use too. It's like. And it's, it's when you're on the treadmill, it's going to be because it, it uses both of your hands. I, I just have not been a big fan of this. I should do a giveaway. That would be cool. Ugh. And then this one absolutely is, is just not worth buying. It's first of all, it's like 20 pounds. It's heavy as hell. Uh, Oh, it, I mean, it's good. It works. Like this is this is actually a pretty good workout uh, right now. But it's just like I'm not doing this on the treadmill. I'm not doing this um, very often. This is this is basically this is a intense like workout. Like you 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 can't do this while doing other things. Like even just doing like overhead things like this are uh, like you know this this is a real piece of equipment and this is this is half resistance as well it's adjustable resistance so i'll probably use this more actually now that i think of it i'm trying to get uh, activity to register in right away in the morning because after six hours of fasting your uh body fat comes into play when it comes to like exercising so like I'm trying to exercise right in the morning for, for like two minutes, uh, for 20 minutes. Uh, if you exercise for 15 minutes and register a strain value of five, it shows up in whoop. So I, I want to get that as, as the first thing I do every morning is to, you know, reduce my body fat because my body fat percentage is too high. So, um, I want to, I want to figure out how to do that. Um, this morning I did it and I didn't hit, I didn't get a activity. I, I walked at five miles per hour for 20 minutes and, uh, it didn't register as an activity. So if I, if I walk five miles per hour, 20 minutes doing this, I guarantee you it will <laughs> register as, as an activity. So I'll try that, uh, tomorrow morning. But anyways, this was just an aside. It probably should be its own video. Um, something's beeping. It's the battery saver on my headphone. I just need to fiddle with it and it goes away so this should be its own video maybe i can edit it out and make it its own video but it's something i definitely think is critical for technology professionals to think about and to have some kind of thing that they're doing and grip training training is like the the lowest of the hanging fruits it's so easy you know you just have these toys at your desk and you just you just you know it's so good for your mind it's so good for your grip strength is like one of the markers of longevity so it's i definitely recommend grip straining and my favorite thing about it is you can make all kinds of progress in it it's like you can start out and not even be able to pull the the 50 on for one of these and then just after like a few weeks a few months you can pull the 150 like like it's it's insane how much how much uh progress you can make and it's all really easy to measure with one of these things and none of these are are that expensive for you know for a hundred dollars you can get a good set of of uh grip training gear for twenty dollars you know you can get like one of these and like one of these and like work this motion and then and then this motion though know, the two work opening your hand and work closing your hand you can do that for you can do that for nothing just buy a bunch of rubber bands and you know do it. it's like yeah it's yes yes all right but anyway back to the video okay so my sedentary time's on the clock um so what we're gonna do oh yeah we finished up that so we, we talked about configuration maps um yeah so let's go to the have a conversation about the next thing so show me an example of passing in secret info with kubernetes secrets show me an example of passing in secret info with kubernetes secrets
Certainly, here's an example of creating a Kubernetes secret to store sensitive information, such as passwords or API keys, using YAML format. In this example, API version and can specify the Kubernetes API version and resource type, which is a secret in this case. Metadata contains metadata about the secret, including its name, which is my secret, in this example. Type specifies the type of secret. Opaque is a commonly used type for generic data. Under the data section, you define key value pairs to store sensitive information. Each key corresponds to a secret parameter, E, G. Username and password, and the associated value should be base64 encoded. In this example, we have two parameters, username and password, each with their base64 encoded values. To create the secret, you can save the YAML configuration to a file, E, G, my secret, YAML, and then apply it using the kubectl apply command. After creating the secret, you can reference its values in pods or other Kubernetes resources by mounting the secret as a volume or by using environment variables. For example, you can use environment variables to pass the secret data to a container. In this example, we create a pod named my app pod with a container that uses environment variables to access the secret data stored in my secret secret. The value from field with secret key ref is used to reference the specific keys within the secret. Using secrets in this way allows you to securely manage and pass sensitive information to your application containers without exposing the actual values in the VOD's configuration. Okay, all right, so so that's good. So the next one is uh, show me a test of the microservice app. Show me a test of the microservice app. Yeah. So oh. below is a simplified example of how you might test a microservices based application yeah. using a popular testing okay. framework called PyTest in Python. This example assumes that you have a microservices application with multiple this services and you want to write and run tests for one of those services. Let's say you have a Python based microservice that exposes an API and you want to write tests for it. Here's a basic example. Install PyTest. First, ensure that you have PyTest installed. You can install it using pip, write test cases, create... All right, so that's a little bit different. It's kind of more complicated. So I'm going to uh, click on the next video. And then Kubernetes is amazingly powerful. And then uh, move it back to the beginning. Oh, we're in, we're in hoodie mode now. Getting really, really deep into it. Started with a suit and we're ending with a hoodie here. So now we're really a Kubernetes expert. So I'm gonna pause it, come back, and then we'll we'll close out uh, this whole series, even if it takes like three hours. All right, I'm back. Let's keep going. Kubernetes is amazingly powerful, but if you're just getting started, it might also seem amazingly complicated. So let's learn how to debug applications running on Kubernetes. Hi, Kaslin. Thanks for coming by. I've been learning a lot about Kubernetes from you. You know about pods and services, containers, and more, and they mostly work pretty well. But what do I do when things aren't working? Oh, that's a great question. Learning how to debug Kubernetes is very useful, especially because applications on Kubernetes can grow so large, it can be very difficult to know what's going on in your system at any given time. Exactly. If I was just doing everything manually and only had a few instances, I'd know how and where to look for the information I need. And with Kubernetes abstracting away the infrastructure behind the application, I don't even know where to start. Well, let's start with what you do know. How do you currently debug Kubernetes? The kubectl command line tool is some useful tooling I've been using. I found them using kubectl help, but my favorite so far are kubectl explain, kubectl describe, kubectl logs, and kubectl git with the dash o flag. How do you use those? Well, I, I use kubectl explain whenever I come across a new API object that I don't know. What's especially nice about it is how I can dig into the oh, documentation nice. of specific fields too. So it's like a one-stop command line shop for defining objects. Like kubectl that. logs is useful because it lets me see what's happening inside of a pod. It logs events from containers and stores them so I can easily access them. Then I use the trusty kubectl describe to look at pod states and events. That's a great start. Kubectl describe can tell you a lot. For instance, if a pod is pending, that could mean you have insufficient resources that prevent the pod from getting scheduled onto a node. So maybe in that case, I could delete another pod or create a new node to make space. Yeah, that might be a good way to handle it. Another state a pod can be in is the waiting state. Oh, I have seen that. Yeah, that happens when a pod has been scheduled onto a node, but it can't run. For instance, maybe the image can't be pulled. So even though there's space to run the app, it just won't work. Hmm. What about other cases? Like if there's space to run the app and the image is working, but the app itself is broken. I'm not sure how to debug that. For cases like that, kubectl exec is your friend. Oh, let me look that up. Kubectl exec lets me execute a command in a container or even open an interactive shell in the container. Wow, that's useful. So if you needed to dig around inside of your application, maybe to see where files are being stored or what ports are accessible inside the container, exec is a really useful tool for that. Mm, okay, so to summarize, depending on the state my pod is in, whether it's pending, waiting, or otherwise running but somehow failing, that determines what my issue might be. Yes, and by using logs, the exec command, and other very simple commands, you can generally find out enough information to troubleshoot your application. Wow, thanks again to Kaza for always dropping knowledge. In this episode, we learned a lot about debugging Kubernetes application. For more information, check out the links in the description below. All right, so let me talk to the. So tell so we got a brief overview of service oh, objects oh, last oh, season. Oh, oh, let's go back. Kubernetes. So tell me about the cube K U B E C T L command line tool. Tell me about the K U B E C T L command line tool. Kubectl is the command line tool for interacting with and managing Kubernetes clusters. 
It serves as the primary interface for administrators, developers, and operators to interact with Kubernetes resources, perform cluster operations, and manage containerized applications within a Kubernetes environment. Here's an overview of Kubigel and its key features. Resource management. Kubigel allows users to create, read, update, and delete various Kubernetes resources, such as pods, deployments, services, config maps, and secrets. Users can apply declarative configuration files to define the desired state of resources within a cluster. Cluster interaction. Kubigel provides commands to interact with the Kubernetes cluster itself, including cluster information, contexts, and authentication. Users can switch between different clusters or namespaces, view cluster status, and manage authentication tokens. Resource inspection. Users can inspect the current state of Kubernetes resources, including resource details, labels, annotations, and resource-specific logs. Descriptive commands like kubigel get, kubigel describe, and kubigel logs are commonly used for resource inspection. Scaling and load balancing. Kubigel offers commands to scale the number of replicas in a deployment or replicate stateful sets. It can also manage services to create load balancers for distributing traffic to pods. Troubleshooting and debugging. Users can debug applications and pods using kubigel exec to access container shells and kubigel logs to retrieve container logs. Troubleshooting commands allow for diagnosing issues, inspecting resource states, and validating configurations. Resource port forwarding. Kubigel port forward enables users to forward network ports from local machines to pods, allowing direct interaction with services running inside containers. Custom resource definitions, CRDs, Kubigel supports CRDs, allowing users to interact with custom resources and custom controllers within Kubernetes clusters. Plugins and extensibility, Kubigel can be extended with plugins, which add custom commands and functionality for specific use cases. Users can install and manage these plugins to enhance their Kubernetes CLI experience. Kubigconfig and context, Kubigel uses a Kubigconfig file to manage cluster configuration, including cluster endpoints, user authentication, and context switching. Users can configure multiple contexts for different clusters or namespaces, making it easy to switch between environments. Scripting and automation, Kubigel is scriptable and can be integrated into automation workflows, C, CD pipelines, and shell scripts. It provides JSON and YAML output formats for scripting and parsing data. Open source and community driven, Kubigel is an open source tool maintained by the Kubernetes community, making it continuously updated and improved. Overall, Kubigel is an essential tool for Kubernetes administration and application management. It simplifies the process of interacting with Kubernetes clusters and helps users perform a wide range of tasks, from resource management to troubleshooting and automation. All right, so that looks good. Um, I think there's one more. Oh, there, there's a few more. Uh, so what, what did I... Tell me about, okay, so, so the next one is, show me some use cases for the different kubectl commands. Show me some use cases for the different kubectl commands. Certainly, here are some common use cases for different Kubigel commands in Kubernetes. Resource management, Kubigel create, use it to create new resources such as pods, deployments, services, config maps, or secrets from YAML or JSON configuration files. Kubigel apply, apply declarative configuration files to create or update resources. Useful for maintaining the desired state of resources. Kubigel delete, delete resources including pods, deployments, services, config maps, and more to clean up or scale down your application. Resource inspection, Kubigel get, list resources of a specific type in the current namespace or across namespaces. Helpful for viewing the current state of resources. Kubigel describe, retrieve detailed information about a specific resource, including labels, annotations, events, and current status. Kubigel logs, view the logs of containers running in pods to troubleshoot issues or monitor application behavior. Cluster operations, Kubigel cluster info, display information about the Kubernetes cluster, including the API server and dashboard URLs. Kubigel config, manage Kubigel config files, switch between contexts, and set up authentication for different clusters. Kubigel version, check the client and server version information for Kubigel in the connected cluster. Scaling and load balancing, Kubigel scale, scale the number of replicas in a deployment, stateful set, or replica set and manage application load. Kubigel Expose, create a service resource to expose pods and provide load balancing for external access. Troubleshooting and debugging, Kubigel Exec, access a shell within a running container for debugging and running commands inside the container. Kubigel Port Forward, forward network ports from local machine to a pod, enabling direct interaction with services in the pod. Kubigel Talk, display CPU and memory usage statistics for pods and nodes, helping you identify performance bottlenecks. Custom resource definitions, CRDs, Kubigel Get CRD, list custom resource definitions to see what custom resources are available in the cluster. Kubigel Get custom resource name, interact with custom resources created using CRDs, perform CRUD operations, and view custom resource details. Plugins and extensibility, Kubigel plugin, manage and run custom plugins to extend Kubigel functionality for specific use cases, such as interacting with third-party tools. Scripting and automation, Kubigel get OJSON and Kubigel get OYAML, output resource data in JSON or YAML format for scripting, parsing, or further processing and automation workflows. These are just a few examples of how Kubigel commands can be used in various scenarios within Kubernetes. Depending on your specific needs and tasks, you can leverage Kubigel to interact with Kubernetes resources, troubleshoot issues, inspect cluster information, and automate cluster management tasks. Okay, so let's go to the next one. So that was use cases. Okay, so tell me about pod status meaning. Tell me about pod status meaning. In Kubernetes, the status of a pod provides information about the current state of the pod and its containers. Understanding the pod status is crucial for monitoring and troubleshooting applications running in the cluster. Here are some common pod statuses and their meanings. Pending, the pod is in the pending status when it has been created but has not yet been assigned to a node. Possible reasons for this status include resource constraints, node availability, or scheduling issues. Pods can remain in this state while Kubernetes tries to find a suitable node to run them on. 
running. A pod is in the running status when all of its containers are up and running. This is the desired state for most pods, indicating that the application is operational. Succeeded. A pod is in the succeeded status when all containers in the pod have terminated successfully, and the pod has completed its job. This is often seen with bad jobs or one-done tasks that exit upon completion. Failed. A pod is in the failed status when one or more containers in the pod have terminated with an error or failed to start. Review container logs and events that diagnose the cause of the failure. Unknown. A pod is in the unknown status when Kubernetes is unable to determine the status of the pod. This status might occur due to communication issues between the control plane and nodes or when the VOD's container runtime is unresponsive. Terminating. A pod is in the terminating status when it is in the process of being gracefully terminated. This status indicates that containers are in the process of shutting down. Container creating. A pod is in the container creating status when Kubernetes is in the process of creating the containers within the pod. This status occurs briefly during the VOD's initialization phase. Crash loop backoff. A pod is in the crash loop backoff status when one or more containers within the pod are repeatedly crashing and restarting. This status can be an indicator of issues within the application or container. Image pull backoff. A pod is in the image pull backoff status when it is unable to pull the container image specified in its configuration. Check the image name and credentials to resolve this issue. Completed. A pod is in the completed status when all containers have run to completion and the pod has finished its task successfully. This status is similar to succeeded, but indicates that the pod is not actively running. It's important to regularly monitor the status of pods within your Kubernetes cluster to detect and resolve issues promptly. You can use the kubectl get pods command to view the status of all pods in namespace and investigate any pods that are not in the running, save to identify and address problems. Additionally, examining container logs and events can provide valuable insights into the root causes of pod status issues. Okay, so that that's good. Um, uh, tell me how to debug a broken application. Show me how to debug a broken application. What? What? I can't do it. Debugging a broken application in Kubernetes cluster involves identifying, diagnosing, and resolving issues within the application of the cluster itself. Here's a step by step guide on how to debug a broken application in Kubernetes. Check pod status. Use the kubectl get pods command to list all pods in the namespace where your application is deployed. Look for pods that failed, crash loop backoff, or pending state as these indicate potential issues. Inspect logs. Use the kubectl logs less than pod name greater than command to view the logs of a specific container within pod. Check for error messages or unexpected behavior in the container's logs to identify the cause of the issue. You can also use the C flag to specify a container if a pod has multiple containers. Describe pods. Run kubectl describe pod less than pod name greater than to get detailed information about the pod, including its events and conditions. We got a brief Look for events that might provide on. insights into why the pod is not running correctly. Debugging containers. If you suspect issues within a container, you can use kubectl exec to access a shell within the container for interactive debugging. For example, you can run kubectl exec at less than pod name greater than bin bash to access a shell in the first container of a specified pod. Check resources. Ensure that the cluster has enough resources, CPU, memory, etc. To run the application. Resource constraints can cause pods to fail. Review resource requests and limits specified in the VOD's configuration. Check configurations. Review the configuration files, E. G. Deployments, config maps, secrets used by your application to ensure they are correctly defined. Check environment variables, mount paths, and other configuration settings within your pods. Check network connectivity. Verify that your application can access required external services, databases, and endpoints. Check network policies or firewall rules that might be affecting network connectivity. Check dependencies. If your application depends on other services or components, ensure they are functioning correctly. Debug and verify external dependencies as needed. Scale and load balancing. Consider scaling the number of replicas for your application if it is under heavy load. Check if services and load balancing are properly configured to distribute traffic. Monitoring and metrics. Implement monitoring and observability tools. E. G. Prometheus, Profana, to collect metrics and monitor the health of your application and cluster. Version control and rollback. If you recently deployed a new version of your application, consider rolling back to a previous version if the issue is related to the update. Collaboration. Collaborate with your team or colleagues to gather additional insights and ideas for debugging. Oh, is that it? That's not reading anymore. All right, so... Use Kubernetes yeah. RBAC oh. to control access and provide limited access to others for debugging purposes. Role-based access Documentation control. and knowledge base. Consult documentation, logs, and knowledge base articles specific to your application and its components. Kubernetes events. Keep an eye on Kubernetes events using Kubernetes events or by checking your cluster's event logs. Events can provide information about scheduling failures, node issues, or other cluster-related problems. Debugging tools. Consider using Kubernetes native debugging tools like Kubeconfig, Kubernetes debug, or QDNS debugger for more advanced debugging tasks. Engage with the community. If you are unable to resolve the issue, engage with the Kubernetes community, forums, or support channels for assistance. Remember that debugging a broken application in Kubernetes can be a complex process, and it often involves a combination of the above steps. Thoroughly investigate each aspect of your application and cluster to pinpoint and address the root cause of the issue. Additionally, automation, monitoring, and observability practices can help proactively detect and prevent issues in your Kubernetes environment. All right. Um, so, what's next? Um, oh, yeah, okay. So, um, one thing I've been thinking about doing, too, is... Uh, Okay, based on everything we've discussed so far, because I want to learn this and I want to add this to my like technology skill set and be able to like talk about this during interviews and like give talks about this and like actually implement it in the real world in like ways that 
really will help. So like, can you please generate some Anki flashcards for me and like generate it with like show me Python code that I can use to run that will automatically use the API to create the a flashcard deck. Deck. Why is it being so bad? Stop it. Ah. What is wrong with it? Is it like too, is the conversation too long? Maybe the conversation is too long. It's like out of tokens or whatever. Yeah, something's going wrong. All right, well, that's okay, because it was time to move on to the next video anyway. I'll open a new chat and then uh, ask the questions to the new chat. Um, I feel like I do need a quick break here. Um, what is it? It's Tuesday today. Uh, I don't know. No, you know what? I'm just going to power through it and try to close this out. We got a brief overview of service objects last season, but it's time to take a deeper dive into services. Hi, Kaslin. It's good to see you. I was just getting ready to learn more about services. Maybe you could help me out? Sure. I remember how we covered how services were used to abstract away pod lifecycle events last season. Right, because pods are made to be started, stopped, terminated, and created, but oftentimes applications need to have a long-lived or permanent address to reach for interacting with services. Yes. So if you had a server backend for storing images, it might not matter which pod serves the data back to your front end but the front end would always need to know where to find your back end to request pictures. And since each pod gets its own IP address, that would be a lot to manage, you know, storing an IP address whenever a pod gets started or stopped. So services exist to store them for us, making our development much easier and more scalable. Uh, but I remember we created a special type of service last time called a load balancer. What was that about? Well, see, there's more than just one type of service. Depending on what you're trying to do, one may be more suited to your needs. But before that, let's go into how to define services. If I had a set of pods that each listen on TCP port 9376 and carry a label app equals my app, the YAML manifest file would look like this. This specification creates a new service object called my service, which targets TCP port 9376 on any pod with the app equals my app label. This is taking traffic from port 9376 and routing it to the pod's default port, port 80, which greatly simplifies app development. Wait a minute, what IP address does the service have? When I say it's getting traffic from port 9376, that must mean the service itself gets an IP address, right? Right. Kubernetes assigns this service an IP address, which is sometimes called the cluster IP. And this brings us to the first type of service, the default cluster IP type. The cluster IP service type is only reachable from other points within the cluster. We actually used these before last season to connect our front-end service to the auth and back-end services. All of those were running in Kubernetes, so they just needed a cluster IP to talk to each other. So then the next type must be the load balancer type that we also used in the last episode. Well, actually, no. <laughs> see, when you create a load balancer type service, uh, you can see that it actually has an internal cluster IP address. The load balancer service type also uses what's called a node port service underneath the hood. The documentation says a node port service exposes a service on each node IP at a static point. This type of service also has a cluster IP, and to access it, you reference the node IP node port address. Um, please help me make sense of why we want to do this. <laughs> Great question. You see, the load balancer type actually uses node ports under the hood. At some level, pods are running on nodes, so the only way to access them is by actually talking to the machine they're on. The difference is that the load balancer types are pre-configured to use a cloud provider's load balancer for you. So if you're using GKE on Google Cloud, you'll be using Google Cloud's load balancer to distribute requests from your service to your pod instances. But what happens if you're running on-prem and don't have a cloud-provided load balancer? Or what about when you want to roll your own load balancer? Oh. In that case, I'd need access to no port myself, I guess. Exactly. So we have cluster IP services for routing internal traffic, node ports for allowing external access to a specific port on a specific machine, and load balancers for using cloud-provided load balancer to route traffic between a service's pods. That's pretty robust. Are there any other types? Well, there are more advanced types of services like external name services or headless services. And there's even a higher level object called ingress objects that are used to expose multiple services. But I think we can save those for another day. Many thanks to Kaslin again for continuing to drop Kubernetes knowledge my way. I'm excited to go play with services more and see what I can create for myself. For more information about services, please check out the links in the description. All right, so let's have a conversation with the AI. 
Give me an overview of Kubernetes services. Ah, oh, the whole thing's messed up. I'm not even using ChatGPT for. Give me an overview of Kubernetes services. Stop it. I should have been using version three. Kubernetes services are a fundamental concept within a Kubernetes container orchestration system. A Kubernetes service is a logical abstraction that provides a consistent way to access a group of pods, which are the smallest deployable units in Kubernetes. Pods are often ephemeral and can be killed and recreated frequently. Services provide a stable endpoint that clients can connect to, regardless of the changes in pods. When you create a Kubernetes service, you define a logical set of pods based on label selectors and a policy about which they can be accessed. The service assigns a unique IP address, cluster IP, and a port number to the set, and these details remain constant for the lifetime of the service, even if the pod behind the service are replaced or changed. The main goal of Kubernetes services is to allow applications to be exposed to the network without the need to modify the applications to fit into a specific service discovery mechanism. This abstraction separates the way applications communicate within the cluster from the actual implementation details of pod networking, thus providing a more straightforward approach to internal and external communication. In essence, Kubernetes itself is a container orchestration platform designed to automate the deployment, scaling, and operations of application containers across clusters of hosts. It was developed by Google and is now maintained by the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, CNCF. Kubernetes services play a crucial role in the system by managing how the network traffic is directed to the applications running within the containers, offering a practical and reliable way to access and manage applications, regardless of the complex and dynamic nature of the environment in which they run. All right, so show me the different types of services. Show me the different types of services. Dong.com. I don't know what it's going to show me. In Kubernetes, there are several types of services that cater to different needs and use cases. Cluster IP services. These are the default Kubernetes services that provide internal connectivity within the cluster. They assign a stable, internal IP address to a service, which is only accessible within the cluster. Cluster IP services are suitable for internal communication between different components of an application. Node port services. Node port services build upon cluster IP services by making the application accessible from outside the Kubernetes cluster. They do this by opening a specific port on all nodes, servers, and the cluster and routing traffic from that port to the cluster IP service. This tab is useful for exposing services that need to be accessible from outside the cluster, like web application. I like this better. Load balancer services. Load balancer services are designed for applications that require high availability and scalability. They facilitate external access by provisioning a cloud provider's load balancer to distribute income traffic among nodes. This service tab is ideal for production environments where managing high traffic volumes is crucial. Each service tab has its own use cases, accessibility scope, and resource allocation requirements. For instance, cluster IP is for internal use within the cluster and requires minimal resources, node port is for external access through a node's IP at a specific port and needs additional resources, and load balancer is used in production with high traffic, requiring significant resources and usually being accessible via cloud provider's load balancer. All right. All right, tell me more about the cluster IP service. Tell me more about the cluster IP service. The cluster IP service is the default Kubernetes service type that provides a service inside the Kubernetes cluster with an internal IP address that other components can use to access the service. This IP address is only reachable within the cluster, making cluster IP suitable for internal processes that do not require exposure to the external network. Here are some key points about cluster IP services. Stability, the IP address remains stable throughout the lifecycle of the service, ensuring consistent internal access. Internal communication. Cluster IP is ideal for enabling communication between different services within a cluster, like between front-end and back-end components of an application. Load balancing. It automatically load balances traffic across the pods that match the services like criteria. Service discovery. It integrates with Kubernetes DNS to provide a DNS name for the service, allowing pods to resolve the service by name instead of by IP address. Cluster IP services are defined in YAML files and applied to the cluster using Kubectl, the command line tool for interacting with Kubernetes. In the YAML file, you specify the selector that determines which pods will be part of the service and the ports the service will be accessible on from within the cluster. All right. Tell me more about the node port service. Tell me more about the node ports service. The node port service in Kubernetes is an extension of the cluster IP service that allows for external access to services. 
Here's what sets node port apart. External access exposes the service on each node's IP at a stack port, node port. External traffic can access the service via the node port, which is open on every node in the cluster. Port allocation. Kubernetes allocates a port from a default range, 3000-32767, but you can specify a particular port in this range if it's not already in use. Routing. Traffic sent to the node port is automatically forwarded to the corresponding cluster IP service and then to the appropriate pods. Use case. It's suitable for scenarios where direct access to a service is needed from outside the cluster but where a load balancer is not necessary or available. Limitations. Since node port uses high number ports, it may not be suitable for all scenarios, particularly if standard web ports 8443 are required. Node port is often used during development or in environments where a dedicated load balancer is overkill or cost prohibitive. It's a convenient way to get external traffic into your cluster for certain types of applications. Uh, all right. Tell me more about um, load balancer service. Tell me more about load balancer services. All right, just service. The load balancer service in Kubernetes is designed to expose services to the external network by provisioning load balancer from the underlying cloud infrastructure. Here's a detailed look at load balancer services. Automatic provisioning. When you create a load balancer service, Kubernetes interacts with the cloud provider to provision load balancer, which then automatically routes external traffic to the service. Public access. The load balancer receives a publicly accessible IP address that clients can use to access the service from outside the Kubernetes cluster. Built-in load balancing. The load balancer distributes interim traffic among the services pods to evenly distribute the load. High availability. Load balancer services are typically used in production environments where high availability is essential. Integration with cloud providers. It works seamlessly with cloud providers like AWS, Google Cloud, and Azure, leveraging their native load balancing features for Kubernetes services. This service is most beneficial when you need to manage high volumes of traffic and require the robustness and features of a full-fledged load balancer provided by cloud infrastructure. All right. All right. So two videos left. Um, I'm gonna knock off uh, this one, and then I'll come back, take a take a break, and then come back and finish the. If series. you're working on Kubernetes in a production environment, especially on a larger project or team, you've probably run into namespaces. We haven't talked about them before, but today we changed that. Hello, Kaslin. Hello, Kaslin. Hmm. Kaslin isn't in this room. Maybe I'll go to another one. Hello, Kaslin. Oh, hi, Carter. What are you doing here? I came to talk to you about namespaces, but I don't think I could reach you before. That's kind of ironic, actually. Namespaces are a tool to keep Kubernetes objects separated as well. If you're in the wrong space, you won't be able to communicate with your objects. I could see that being useful. Kind of like how containers allow multiple applications to share one operating system, namespaces allow multiple Kubernetes objects to share one cluster. Right. Imagining it as a sort of virtual cluster makes a lot of sense, because a namespace groups and isolates Kubernetes objects across nodes. And it's not quite as strict as container isolation, because it's still possible to access Kubernetes objects that are in other namespaces. That's good to know. So a namespace is a virtual cluster that's used to make it easier for large teams to work. I've seen these before. I was working on a project where the test and production objects were in separate namespaces. Sure, I've seen that. Another benefit of namespaces comes in with setting permissions. Oh yeah, I remember. The admin set it up so that only certain people could push a build to production, but anyone could push a build to test. They would have done that using Kubernetes role-based access controls, or RBAC. Using RBAC, an administrator can give each user a role, which sets their permissions inside a specific namespace. That makes sense. So the people on my team must have had roles that gave them access to test, but only a few people had roles that gave them access to production. Right. Let's talk more about how to set up the namespaces themselves. We can cover RBAC or role-based access controls in a future episode. Sounds good to me. So how do I get started using namespaces? Technically, you already are. Kubernetes starts with four initial namespaces. You can check them out with the kubectl get namespace command. According to the docs, kube system is for objects created by the Kubernetes system. Kube public is mostly reserved for cluster usage in case some resources should be visible and readable publicly throughout the whole cluster. Kube node lease is for the lease objects associated with each node, which improves the performance of the node heartbeats as the cluster scales. And the default namespace is for objects with no other namespace. It's, it's like one of those bottom drawers in the kitchen. Just throw anything in there. You can get more info about any of these namespaces using the kubectl get and describe commands. For instance, you'll see that describing the default namespace returns something like this. Note that these details show both resource quota, if present, as well as resource limit ranges. Resource quotas and resource limits. Resource quota tracks aggregate usage of resources in the namespace and allows cluster operators to define hard resource usage limits that a namespace may consume. A limit range defines minimum and maximum constraints on the amount of resources a single entity can consume in a namespace. That seems useful if I need to make sure resource usage is staying within certain bounds. Yep. Resource quotas and limits are an important tool for administrators. Since namespaces are Kubernetes objects, I bet I can interact with them using the kubectl create and delete commands. Yes. One thing that's a little different is that since namespaces hold other Kubernetes objects, if you want to get, create, delete, or otherwise operate on objects in a namespace, you must specify that with the dash dash namespaces flag. It seems like a lot of extra typing, but I guess the shorthand dash n isn't all that bad. We can actually shorten deployment here to deploy, too. There are a lot of convenient shorthand versions of commands in Kubernetes. That is convenient, though it still seems annoying to have to type the namespace I'm working into every command. Well, you're in luck. If you're going to be working out of the same namespace for a while, there's a way to set kubectl to automatically use that namespace for all subsequent kubectl commands. To do that, you would use kubectl config set context. 
Now that sounds handy. So I think that's about it for the basics. You should have just about everything you need to know to understand namespaces in case you see them in the workplace. I think so. Uh, let me see if I've got this right. A namespace is a virtual cluster that lets multiple groups of users share a cluster. Each one has its own resources, policies, and constraints, meaning only people or objects in my namespace will see my pods, services, and other Kubernetes objects. Also, I can find rules for who can do what in my namespace, and I can enforce how many resources can be consumed by objects in my namespace using resource limits and quotas. Exactly. Namespaces are a very useful tool for everything you just mentioned and more. Wow. Many thanks to Kazlin for sharing knowledge about namespaces. For more information about how, when, and why to use them, please check out the documentation link below. All right. And there's no documentation link. Oh, there is. Okay. That actually, that's good. Um, is the hands-on on there? No. Um, so let me ask the, so, so tell me about, uh, give me details about Kubernetes namespaces. Give me details about Kubernetes namespaces. I'm just browsing with Bing. Um, okay, give me tips for interacting. Kubernetes.io. Kubernetes namespaces are a way to divide cluster resources between multiple users within the same cluster. Here are the details about Kubernetes namespaces. Resource isolation. Namespaces provide a mechanism for isolating groups of resources. What's a cluster? They allow you to manage resources in a multi-tenant environment where there are many users across multiple teams or projects. Naming. Each resource within a namespace needs to have a unique name, but that same name can be used in different namespaces. Namespaces themselves cannot be nested and resource can only belong to one namespace. Initial namespaces. By default, Kubernetes starts with four initial namespaces, default for regular workloads, cube system for objects created by the Kubernetes system, cube public for resources that should be publicly accessible across the cluster, and cube node lease which holds lease objects associated with each node to assist in node management. DNS and namespaces. When service is created, it also creates a DNS entry in the format less than service name greater than. Less than namespace name greater than. SVC. Cluster. Local, which aids in the service discovery within the cluster. This allows the same configuration to be used across multiple namespaces like development, staging, and production. Using namespaces effectively can help in organizing resources, managing access to resources by different teams, and in simplifying the management of resources in large cluster. All right. Okay, give me... Give me tips for interacting with Kubernetes namespaces. Here are some tips for interacting with Kubernetes namespaces. Understand the default namespace. Be aware that if you don't specify a namespace, Kubernetes will assume you're referring to the default namespace. Use namespaces to organize resources. Leverage namespaces to organize your cluster resources by team, environment, e, g, dev, test, prod, or application. Avoid using cube prefix. This prefix is reserved for Kubernetes system namespaces. Set a namespace context. Use kubectl config set context to set the default namespace for your current context to avoid having to specify the namespace for every command. Use labels for additional filtering. While namespaces allow for a broad grouping of resources, labels can provide more granular filtering within namespace. Regularly review namespaces. Use Google Calculate namespaces to keep track of the namespaces and their status within your cluster. Resource quotas and limits. Implement resource quotas and limits within namespaces to manage resource consumption by different teams or projects. Understand namespace limitations. Remember that namespaces are not an absolute security boundary and should not be used as such. Use Kubernetes RBAC for controlling access to resources within namespace. Clean up. When you delete a namespace, all the resources under it are also deleted. Make sure to regularly clean up and use namespaces to keep your cluster tidy. Namespace specific configurations. When deploying resources, use namespace specific configurations to ensure that resources like config maps and secrets are not mistakenly shared across environments or applications. What is the Lindy effect and what parts of this are most congruent with the Lindy effect and which are the Lindy effect? And so which parts of what we're talking about here are most congruent with the Lindy effect and which ones are the most divergent? The Lindy effect is a theory that the future life expectancy of some non-perishable things, like a technology or an idea, is proportional to their current age. So, the longer something has been around, the longer it is likely to persist into the future. This concept is often applied to cultural items, technologies, or even businesses. When we talk about Kubernetes and its services, the aspects that are most congruent with the Lindy effect will likely be the core concepts and components that have been part of Kubernetes since its early days and have remained relatively unchanged, indicating their robustness and longevity. 
Features of pods, services, and namespaces might fall into this category. On the other hand, the features of practices that are newer or more subject to change are the most divergent from millennia effect. In the fast-evolving landscape of Kubernetes, this can include newer APIs, tools, or practices that haven't yet stood the test of time. In the context of Kubernetes namespaces, the concept of isolating and managing cluster resources has been part of Kubernetes since its inception and has remained a fundamental aspect of its architecture, indicating the congruence with millennia effect. However, any new best practices or tools for managing namespaces would be less congruent, given their lack of historical endurance. Okay. So it's it's pods, services, and namespaces. All right, final video. Hooray. Oh, man, I need to be done so bad. Okay. With the whole universe of things to learn, it's important to start with the essentials. Let's go over the concepts that make Kubernetes usable, scalable, and just downright awesome. Are you ready? Hello, I'm Kazan Fields. I'm a developer advocate at Google Cloud, where I focus on Kubernetes and Google Kubernetes Engine. Today, we're going to be demonstrating what it's like to get hands-on with some Kubernetes essentials. And to guide us, we have an expert, Anthony Bouchon. Anthony, would you introduce yourself? Yeah, happy to. Thanks for having me here, Kazan. My name is Anthony Bouchon. I'm a specialist customer engineer at Google, uh, focused on working with users uh, who are trying to run Kubernetes uh, on GKE in production. Wow, so you must have some really cool insights into how this stuff works in the real world. So I'm really excited to see what you're going to teach us today. <laughs> Definitely just trying to build on the concepts that you and Carter have introduced uh, in previous episodes of Kubernetes Essentials. Specifically, we're going to take a look at how you can uh, work with namespaces and services when something is going wrong with the deployment of your application in Kubernetes. They each have respective properties that we can take a look at to help us debug and help us remediate whatever issue we're, resolving, or we're running into in our Kubernetes environment. Cool, so what are we going to start out with? Well, uh, for starters, we're going to have a sample application running in a Kubernetes cluster. And that sample application is comprised of a front-end pod uh, which is fronted by a service type load balancer. So we have a public IP address, so we can access it in a browser. And that front end pod is communicating with a back end pod. And so the back end pod is returning a whole bunch of information uh, and metadata about the environment in which it's running. And we can actually see here the specific requests that the front end is issuing to the back end. If we take a look at the Kubernetes manifest, we'll see here that uh, they're both re represented by deployments um, and they each reside within uh, their own specific namespaces. So in this specific scenario, we have the front end that is managed by team A running in namespace team A. And then we have uh, the backend application, which is owned by team B, running in namespace team B. Cool. So here we have a website, which has a front end and a backend. And those the, the front end and the backend are each owned by separate teams. And those teams are utilizing different namespaces. So what are we going to look into next? Well, uh, we're going to take a look at uh, uh, the namespaces a bit further so that, so that we can understand what constraints could actually be defined at the namespace level that might actually affect the deployments of our pods and applications. So as you can see, namespaces are a great way to divide the resources within a given cluster across various teams. And namespaces give you a lot of control between what you can actually um, access uh, within a given cluster. Uh, uh, so as you can see here that we have uh, the front end is owned by team A, and we have a namespace called team A. And then we have uh, the back end, which is owned by team B, and it's in the namespace team B. Cool. So let's take a deeper look at these namespaces. So when digging into the namespaces within a given cluster, it can often be a bit difficult to navigate uh, and understand which namespace you're working against. So the QBNS tool is a great tool to show all the namespaces in your cluster, as well as which one your Kubernetes context is currently configured to interact with. Once we know what namespace we're working with, team B in this case, we can run commands like kubectl off can I and define the verbs and resources that we want to interact with. So if we want to delete or create, uh, let's say, pods, we want to be able to check and ensure that we can actually interact with these resources in that given namespace. And so once that we have verified that we have permissions to the namespace to interact with the resources we need to, we can actually describe the namespace and take a look at some of the constraints that are defined at a namespace level. The first one is resource quotas. So uh, if it's a great way to limit the resources that a team can use within a given Kubernetes cluster. So in this case, we're defining a pod resource quota. Um, and it's a great use case for trying to preserve IP allocation across multiple teams sharing the same Kubernetes cluster. So in this case, uh, we're ensuring that this team can only run five pods, which means five IPs that it will consume. We also want to define resource limits. Basically, these are just uh, range, uh, limit ranges that define uh, our minimum and maximum amount of CPU that containers can request uh, when running in this namespace. And so it's a great place to troubleshoot because either these could be reasons why your deployment fails or why your deployment is being blocked because there are constraints in place uh, within that given namespace. So namespaces give us a way to uh, manage and isolate resources on some basis, in this case, on a team basis. And there are also controls in there that we can use to make sure that uh, all of the resources for that team are running the way that we expect them to. Exactly, exactly, right? Like limit ranges, resource quotas, these are all things that could be defined for various teams. Role-based access control is a really good way to not just uh, isolate uh, individual user access to various resources, but also service accounts that workloads use if they require different levels of access uh, within the cluster as well. And uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's also, uh, there are many things that are namespace scope, network policies, for example, that can be, again, uh, different constraints that are defined for where your workloads run. Cool, so what are we gonna dive into next? So we took a little bit about what we can uh, do to understand how namespaces may be affecting our interactions with Kubernetes. So the next thing that we're going to take a look at are Kubernetes services and how we can interact with them to understand what may be going wrong with our application running in a Kubernetes cluster. Cool. So let's take a deeper look at them. Happy to. So uh, if we take a look at the front end that we deployed, we can actually see the uh, host that the front end, uh, the host name that the front end is actually issuing a request against, which is the backend service that is owned by Team B. And so uh, Kubernetes services, as you've talked about in the past, uh, Kaslin, uh, are a nice abstraction um, on top of uh, Kubernetes pods or replicas of a given pod. And so rather than trying to think about a per pod level, we can think about a service level that maps to numerous replicas of a pod. And it's represented by the objects you see here, pods, services, and endpoints. And so when we want to troubleshoot something locally, we can actually port forward against the service where we actually are, again, port forwarding uh, interactions uh, with our backend to our local uh, 8080 port. 
So as you can see, I'm going to issue a command to localhost on port 8080. And we're actually going to get a response directly from our backend that is running in the team B namespace. So basically, when you're going through the debugging uh, cycle, if you need to interact with services locally or things that are a little harder uh, to visualize uh, with like a web UI or something like that, you can actually port forward it to your development workstation and begin to interact with it on your local host. So services give us a way to interact with workloads running on Kubernetes. We can run our apps in pods, uh, but if you have multiple copies of those pods, then how do you interact with the, the workload as a whole? And services give us that. Exactly. And you get a DNS record that gets provisioned. Uh, so again, you don't even have to remember that uh, virtual IP or that cluster IP address. You can actually natively interact with it uh, with a DNS host name that gets, or a DNS record that gets provisioned to Kube DNS or your cluster's DNS. And so it's really useful for, uh, again, clients within a cluster to interact with your application. But it's, again, also useful for end users trying to understand what's going on uh, with the port forward command uh, with kubectl. Nice. So where do we go from here? Well, I, we showed a little bit about DNS. So you know, there's the age-old joke about how it's it's always DNS. So I think it's important to understand a bit more about how we can interact and troubleshoot uh, with the DNS in our Kubernetes cluster. All right, so let's take a look at it. What have you got to show us when we're debugging DNS? So I think the first thing uh, that's important to uh, capture and understand is where uh, kubedns is actually running within our cluster. So uh, we're going to run kubedns again, and we're actually going to see a namespace called kube system. And so kube system is where system pods that are required for the cluster to function, like DNS, uh, typically reside. So if we actually run kubectl get pods, uh, in grep for kubedns, we're going to see a few pods running, two replicas of kubedns, as well as an autoscaler. So I think it's really important to understand, you know, as your cluster scales up, as your workloads scale up, uh, <laughs> the number of DNS uh, queries uh, also typically goes up. And so typically, you want to make sure that your kubedns uh, pods are actually scaling up uh, properly and are able to handle all of the uh, various um, uh, volume of DNS queries uh, coming from your services. And so when something is going wrong, if you take a look at this, we've navigated to a, a YAML file for a DNS utils container. And this is actually giving us a way to interact with uh, kubedns without having to package up uh, tools that we would use to troubleshoot into our application containers. So once we actually apply the DNS utils uh, YAML file, you'll see that this single pod of uh, called DNS utils has been created. And then we're going to um, take again just verify what namespace it's in. And so we're going to switch to cluster utils. Uh, again, a great way to separate uh, uh, tooling we use to troubleshoot from application workloads. Then we're going to run the kubectl exec command. And we're actually going to pass in a couple flags, dash i and dash t. And this is basically a way for us to kick off an interactive shell within the DNS utils pod. And the DNS utils pod will have tooling that we may want to use to troubleshoot DNS, like NS lookup. And so um, it's also important to know that while you could you know, uh, get the interactive shell by passing dash i and dash t, you can also just uh, execute a single command uh, if, that's as, uh, you know, um, if that's what the use case calls for and not an interactive shell. So what we're doing here is we're actually testing the DNS resolution for our backend service. So we're using gcemi-backend.teamtb. Uh, and we'll see that we actually got the cluster IP returned to us properly. And so once we actually run kubectl get service, uh, we'll actually see that this is um, the same cluster IP that was returned from the DNS resolution. Cool. So what you did here is really interesting. You uh, created a new pod within Kubernetes that had these DNS utils on it. And then you used that pod to debug what was going on with DNS in the cluster. That's really interesting and gives you a really nice way to debug what's happening with DNS without even messing with your other existing applications in the cluster. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like I think it's it gives you a safe way to package up a set of tools that you only need to use for a specific period of time. And then you can spin it down once you're done um, troubleshooting or you've identified the root cause. And I think this really helps uh, minimize what we actually need to bake into our application containers. And that's useful for a whole bunch of reasons, whether it's security, whether it's performance. There are different a bunch of different angles and benefits that we get from making sure that we're not uh, basically causing bloat within our application containers. So what else do we want to go over today? Well, I think it was really uh, you know, cool to see the exec um, uh, functionality within kubectl for our, our sort of toolbox or DNS utils container. We also want to show that this is something that you could do with your application containers as well. So we'll take a little bit uh, further look as to when we would uh, run an exec into our application containers. So kubectl exec, great for utilizing with utility or debugging containers, but also can be used uh, with your application containers as well. Uh, this is useful if you, need to take a, uh, if you need to take a look at the environment in which your application is running. So if something's going wrong with your application as it's running in Kubernetes, we can use this tool to dive into them and figure out what's happening. Exactly. So just building upon the example uh, that uh, we have in this, uh, in this in this video today here, uh, we're going to take a look at, uh, we're going to switch back to the TV namespace. And we're actually going to take a look at our backend container, or our pod here that's running, serving our backend. And we're actually going to run the same kubectl exec command. Uh, and we're going to uh, provide the pod name. So in this case, um, the backend production pod with a specific uh, uh, hash at the end. And then we're going to kick off an interactive shell once again. And so this is a way for us to understand what's going on in our actual runtime environment. So I just ran print end, and I can actually see all the different environment variables that are configured within this environment, this container. And so it's really useful if um, you need to take a peek at things that might change or want to verify that things are correct within the actual container that you're running. And another thing that's interesting about this is that going back to, you know, again, the conversation of uh, creating minimal containers, sometimes you actually won't even have a, uh, a running shell or something that you could um, initiate a connection to. And so uh, in those scenarios, uh, kubectl has actually added functionality for mounting a debugging container um, into that running pod, right? So if you don't have a running shell, there's actually a relatively new functionality that enables you to still get that interactive environment where you can do things like check environment variables or other things that might affect your application um, while you're troubleshooting. 
thanks for that demo, Anthony. You covered a lot of really cool stuff in there and a lot of tips and tricks that even I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I really think we're just scratching the tip of the iceberg here, right? I think I just really wanted to take a look at namespaces and services and some of the essentials that are important that you know folks interacting with Kubernetes should be aware of uh, when trying to figure out when things are going wrong, why they are going wrong, and you know trying to remediate them. But of course, there's so much more to, to dive into, right? Today, we learned about how Kubernetes namespaces can help you isolate and manage resources, for example, on a per team basis. And we learned how services can help you reach your workloads and can help you debug them. Then we learned some great tips and tricks for debugging both networking problems from KubeDNS and how to get into your applications to debug them using KubeExec. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to explore more, we'll have links to additional resources in the description below. And be sure to like and subscribe for more content from Google Cloud. We'll see you next time. All right, that was actually really good. I was, I was impressed with that. So yeah, I'm going to say I'm done with it. Um, never done with anything. I could do flashcards. I could do more hands-on stuff. There's no such thing as being done, but uh, I'm going to say that I am. So we're going to do get status, get add, uh, and then get commit dash M. Um, watched whole series, watched entire series, had convos with AI. Uh, done. Okay. All right. So that's it for um for this um for this video. Knocked off uh another video series. So now next we've got uh, tools and resources. So uh, stay tuned for the next video.